Two weeks ago on the rain-soaked streets of New Orleans, this Chevrolet splashed its way to victory lane. The first American-powered car since 1986 to win an International Motorsports Association Camel GT competition. Today, at the historic Watkins Glen New York Road Circuit, the Chevy Intrepid intends to kick off an Independence Week celebration with a second straight U.S. win over the best sports cars the world has to offer. We've spent two years getting ready to beat the best in the world. We've done it once, and we intend to do it again. At Watkins Glen, the heat is on. Sports coverage presents Speed World. Watkins Glen International, road racing's most hallowed ground, will host the beginning of the stretch run in the 1991 International Motorsports Association Camel GT Sports Car Championship at the Camel Continental. Hello once again, everyone. I'm Bob Varsha. Welcome to a cold and overcast day here at the legendary Glen. Over the years, this racetrack has seen all of the superstars in road racing, from Jimmy Clark to Jackie Stewart to Jochen Rindt to Buck Baker and King Richard Petty. The last three races on the Camel GT Tour have produced victories for the series' newest cars from Nissan, Jaguar, and Chevrolet. So it comes as an interesting irony that here, those cars have been pushed into the distance by Porsche, out of title contention for the first time in two decades, but on the pole for today's race with a blistering record lap in the hands of a Watkins Glen rookie. With me to call the action today, ESPN road racing analyst and a man who has just given up his title as the fastest driver ever at the Glen, David Hobbs. David, it must hurt a little bit. Boo-hoo, my last record gone. <clears throat> In 1985, I did 208 miles an hour down the straight, and that speed held up till yesterday afternoon when Bernd Schneider, before qualifying, said, let's go for it, or the German equivalent. They took all the wing out of the car, and he rocketed down the back straight at 212 miles an hour. But the car must have been handling pretty good because he also set the fastest lap at 146 miles an hour, a new all-time road course record in North America. However, it's cool today. Could rain. They're going to have to put some of that wing back in the car and ride alongside him on the grid Chip Robinson, who's leading the points at the moment. And behind them is Tom Kendall in the sister car to the Chevrolet that won two weeks ago. So I think it's going to be a very, very tough race this afternoon. Talking with young Burnt on the grid is our man Chris McClure. David, I think we have to first pay a little attention to that big lap in qualifying. Burnt, a special setup, and you did get a break with the cloud cover. That's right, it had uh, less wings and um, was also a little gamble because he was not sure it's working. It was a really great lap and was fantastic. What about the changes for the car for a long two and a half hour race? Now we put more downforce on for the full tank and uh, for for the consumption we have to work and the car it's now it's a little bit slow on the street and uh, but for the corner it's better now Bert schneider he's on the pole flanking him is chip robinson he's with dick bergeron and chip robinson has won here the last two times he's been to watkins Glen, but that was on the long course we're on the short course now it's a lot faster how much tougher is it this is going to be a real tough race we got a little bit of a break with the weather it'll be a little bit cooler but uh it's longer than normal it's going to be two and a half hours most of you are running two hour races this year and that's going to be a difficult situation to decide whether or not you can do it by yourself and not need a co-driver. And uh, Bob Earl standing by for me, and uh, hopefully I won't need him. The weather should help us in that regard. How strong are you? Well, I, I'm feeling good. Uh, the car was running good all weekend, so uh, I'm looking forward to, to a good race. Definitely being around at the end. He wants to win this one. And Chip Robinson has been winning this year. He's had two victories in the races run thus far. As we look at the GTP driver's points, you see he leads teammate and three-time defending champion Jeff Brabham by just three points. Davy Jones will be a huge crowd favorite here today as he looks for his first win at this track for Jaguar as a close attendance in the championship, followed by Wayne Taylor on the strength of that great victory a couple of weeks ago in New Orleans, and his teammate with the Chevy team, Tom Kendall of La Cunata, California, not quite out of the hunt just yet. Now, we mentioned Jeff Brabham, the three-time champion. He has had a very, very tough weekend thus far. He had problems with his turbochargers in qualifying, and as a result, did not advance out of the, out of the uh, single car qualifying. And as a result, he's going to find himself way at the back of this field, and it's going to be very interesting to watch Jeff Brabham, who is a sensational sports car driver, come through the field. There you see the race analysis. The purse over a quarter of a million dollars with at least $50,000 to win pending contingency monies. 150 laps of this circuit, 
giving a total of 3.64, uh, 364.2 miles. 24 cars in the field, up from last year, always a good sign. 15 of them, the big GTP Grand Touring prototype cars. And behind them, the Camel Lights cars. Just slightly downsized cars without the availability of turbocharging running for their own honors in this race within a race format. Now let's get down to the starting grid with Dick Bergeron. And I'm with Wayne Taylor. Wayne, you won the last time out, but that was in the rain. We've got dry this afternoon. Can you do it again? Well, we're certainly going to try. You know, we're starting in a real bad position this weekend. We've had problems with uh, uh, a misfire in the engine, and then we had a problem with a vibration in the chassis all weekend, and... Um, uh, then we lost a motor just before qualifying, so we're starting near the back. Um, made some changes to the car for the race as we did in New Orleans, and just gonna, you know, it's a long race, it's two and a half hours. Uh, I'm gonna try and stay with the leaders, and you know, I think the race will probably start in the last half hour. So I'm just gonna sort of monitor what's going on. Yeah, that's Wayne Taylor, Chris McClure. Right at the back of the grid, Jeff Brabham, unfamiliar spot after trouble in qualifying. What was that? Oh, we lost the turbo, unfortunately, when I went out to qualify, so uh, the penalty is you're back here in the back of the field. So it's going to make it tough for us, but uh, that's the way it is. I've just got to do the best I can. In a way, it's a break. It's a two-and-a-half-hour race. Some time to get up there, earn some meaningful points. Well, you know, it's, it's, I, I wish I could look at it as positively as that. But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, I mean, we had a great car, and, and I felt like I had a chance to the pole yesterday. And, uh, but I think we got a good race car, and we're just going to run flat out. And uh, it is a long race, and we're going to see what happens at the end. But we haven't given up yet, I can tell you that. All right, so the three-time defending Camel GT champion will start from the rear in that potent twin-turbo Nissan. Now let's take a closer look at this 2.428-mile race course with David Tennyson on the Denon Ferrari Spice. This year, the Camel GT will be held on the Watkins Glen International Short Course as we approach corner number one. We're in fifth gear here, flat out, approaching the slowest corner on the track, down into second gear through here, dropping into a little bit of camber, camber very critical corner as well, up right up against the curb here, flat out through here, all the way up into fourth gear, and coming into corner number two, setting up for corner number three, which will lead on to the back straight of Watkins Glen, which is extremely fast. This is a good place for drivers to set up for passes, as uh, we're about to do right here, and as well to relax a little bit, take a drink, uh, move our hands as well. It's a very tough circuit on your hands because we have to nature of the corners being so fast we have to grip the wheel real tight passing right here hard on the brakes down into fourth gear for turn number five very hard as well on the drivers here there's a lot of g-forces very quick corner up to about 160 miles an hour here up at the exit very bumpy as well up into fifth gear approaching another one of the extremely fast corners on the track which is corner number six taken in third gear down two gears here very busy part of the track and very bumpy as well up right up against the curb bringing it over to the left hand side setting up for a right hand sweep which is extremely quick as well turn seven very bumpy as well right up against the curb bringing it across to the start finish line right here David Tennyson, just 22 years of age and the kingpin in one of the most powerful Camel Lights teams out here today. We'll be back live to Watkins Glen, New York to await the command to start engines and the green flag that will send the field on its way. Back live at Watkins Glen, Bob Varsha, David Hobbs, Chris McClure, and Dick Bergren with you for the Camel Continental on the IMSA Camel GT Trail. The field of 24 is in the pit lane awaiting the command to start engines. Right now, let's take a look at the way they'll line up with our Sears Die Hard starting grid brought to you by the Die Hard Battery, now with more power when you need it most. On the pole with a record lap, Bernd Schneider of Cologne, Germany, the first pole for a Porsche since the Sunbank 24 hours back in January, a record average speed of over 146 miles an hour. Next to him, the overall points leader, Chip Robinson of Oldwick, New Jersey, in a V6 twin-turbo Nissan NPTI 91. On row two, Tom Kendall of La Cañada, California, in one of two Chevrolet Intrepids in this field. Next to him, the big crowd favorite, Davy Jones, born and raised in nearby Negron, New York, now living in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, looking for the first victory for Jaguar at the Glen. Row three will be Juan Fangio II of the number 99 Toyota, fielded by Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. Next to him, Raul Bozell, the former sports car world champion from Brazil, now living in Miami, Florida, in the second Bud Light Jag. On row four, our ESPN broadcasting colleague Derek Daly of Ireland doing what he likes best in one of three Nissans in this field. 
Next to him, Rocky Moran of Cota de Gaza, California, in the second Gurney All-American Racers Toyota Eagle. Row five will be Wayne Taylor, the winner at New Orleans two weeks ago, now living in Altamont Springs, Florida, in the second Chevy Intrepid. Next to him, Englishman James Weaver of Wiltshire, England, in the all-new Dyson Racing Rainex Porsche 962C. Row six will be Bostonian Brian Bonner and Atlanta driving instructor Jeff Perner in a Chevy-powered Spice. Next to Californians John Hotchkiss and Jim Adams with Pontiac Power. Row seven, Jeff Klein in a Chevy Spice. Next to our Camel Lights pole sitter, Parker Johnstone of Oregon in the Acura Spice with a record lap of 131.5 miles an hour. Row eight will be Martino Fanato and Ruggiero Melgrati of Italy in a Ferrari-powered Spice. Next to the Buick machine of Ken Knott and another former world champion, Fermin Velez of Spain. Row nine, David Tennyson, the young Canadian in our Ferrari Spice with the onboard camera next to New Englanders Frank Jelinek and John Grooms in a Mazda powered racer row 10 Andy Evans and Hugh Fuller in a Buick powered spice next to Tom Hessert of New Jersey in a Buick kudzu racer more on that later row 11 will be John Miro and Tom Sedevi in a Mazda Tiga next to the Buick of Jim Pace from Jackson Mississippi and on the back row John Piero Moretti of Italy and Derek Bell next to Jeff Brabham let's get down to the pit lane now and Chris McClure the quickest lights, it's a usual position. Parker Johnston and the Acura. You insisted yesterday, though, after you got the lights pole, that you would not force this pace. Well, the Acura Buick Goodrich Comptech car has run flawlessly all week. Two and a half hours is a long race. And what we're going to try to do, unless we're forced to, is pace ourselves to at least the first pit stop and then from there make a decision as to whether to sprint to the end or if we still if we still can, go ahead and pace it to the end. Engines are starting. Johnstone ready to go to work. So's David Tennyson. He's with Dick Bergeron. And David Tennyson has won two out of the last three races in the lights. David, you're having tire problems. You're going to be okay today. Yeah, you know, we're hoping that everything's going to be all right, but if, there's, if the racetrack gets hot like it was not qualifying, I don't know how it's, I don't know how we're going to do, but uh, we're going to try to do our best. We're kind of hoping for rain, but it uh, looks like it's going to stay dry today. He's a courageous young man. He's been blistering tires here all weekend. He says he's worried, but he's going to go out and press the throttle anyway. Thank you, Dick. The sun beginning to poke through. Tires, fuel stops, driver changes, lots of stories to be played out today. Live here on ESPN in the Camel Continental at Watkins Glen. We'll be back for live action from one of the world's most famous racetracks in just a moment. Stay with us. We are live at Watkins Glen, New York, as the field of 24 makes its way up the short chute towards turn six and seven. Seven turns on the short course used for the NASCAR Winston Cup cars during their annual summer stop here at the Glen. Bob Varsha and David Hobbs with you. Here are our weather conditions. Completely overcast skies. We had heavy fog and some rain this morning. Temperature now 60 degrees, very high humidity, and the wind blowing pretty much in the driver's faces as they make their way up the start-finish straightaway. A big crowd has not been deterred by the weather. We have great racing conditions here at the Glen. Now, there you see the number 83 Nissan of Jeff Brabham, who's very slow to get off the starting grid. A little bump there between Pullman, Bernd Schneider, and Chip Robinson welcoming the young German to Camel GT racing here in the United States. Jim Sidley of IMSA waves the green flag. We're underway. Bernd Schneider and Chip Robinson will go shoulder to shoulder into turn number one. And Bert Schneider gets there first. Somewhat to my astonishment, the Jaguar tucks in right behind. Chip Robinson there side by side as they come down to that very fast turn two. The field away cleanly, it is Schneider followed by Robinson and then Davy Jones in that twin turbo V6 Jaguar. Jones's car did not sound good during the morning warm up, but he is out there and he's gonna challenge Chip Robinson on the outside. Here's a look at young Bernd Schneider, winner of the Worldwide Porsche Cup competition a year ago, was the most successful Porsche racer in the world. Like many of the drivers in this field, a week ago he was in Le Mans, France, contesting the 24 hours. As, of course, was Davy Jones, coming second in the Jaguar, wanted to win that race badly, but as we know, it went to Mazda. You saw the heavy buffeting there in breaking for turn number six. That's the old part of the racetrack, not been recently repaved and very, very bumpy. And, of course, these cars are ground-effect cars in the best possible sense of the word so they're very stiffly sprung and when they come to bumpy parts it really shows up you can see these cars flapping about in the most uh, unbelievable way of course it is tough on the driver very tough on the driver Davy Jones gets by the 84 red white and blue Nissan of Jim Robinson for second place Baird Schneider something of a surprise up front in the Yost racing Porsche Reinhold Yost 
one of the legendary Porsche campaigners in European competition. Davy right there has been under so much public and press attention, being the local favorite. He is just delighted to be in his race car. And there goes one of the Toyotas, that's the 99 car, got around the intrepid of Tom Kendall. 99 is Juan Fangio. Raul Bussell about to do the same thing to the Intrepid there. No, to six seconds of it. Coming to this turn six, where you said earlier, terribly bumpy there. Big bump as they come off it, bumping into seven. These cars are so stiff, you can really see the buffeting they go through. Very, very quick laps. Just on about a minute, 145 mile an hour. There we see Juan Fangio, the number 99 Toyota. Two and a half litre four cylinder engine. Very, very small, but not the less uh, powerful engine in that car. The Toyota team has had their problems this year. There you are on board with Chip Robinson watching the man at work, sitting very steadily in the machine. And there was a look out the front of David Tennyson's Ferrari Spice Camel Lights machine. Going through that turn two, three, now round through four. Takes fifth gear right about here, I would imagine. There you see them bouncing out of that same turn. That's, sorry, this is the turn coming to turn six. The Jaguar now eating away at the lead of Bert Schneider. Davy Jones quickest through every session except the one that really counted, which of course was yesterday afternoon's qualifying uh, when he got pushed down to third spot, fourth spot. But making up for it this afternoon. The top three cars still bunched very closely. Baron Schneider, Davy Jones, Chip Robinson. Bernd Schneider, young, very, very impressive driver. Won the German Formula 3 championship a few years back. Did some Formula 1, not very successfully with the West Zaxby car. There you see the 83 car. Jeff Brabham hurtling through the field from the back of the grid. Brabham passed 11 cars on the first lap, so whatever problem he seemed to have on the starting grid cleared itself up in a hurry, rocketing down the back stretch at something close to 200 miles an hour, and then this sweeping, long, downhill right-hander. And Jeff Brabham is about to attach himself to the main lead group. Uh, and the speed he's going, he's certainly going to polish off number 98, that's Rocky Moran, 65 car of Tom Kendall. I would think will be disposed of within the next three or four laps. Of course, obviously, catching up with people and getting by them are two different things altogether. We talked about the Toyota engine. Brabham is in the twin-turbo Nissan 3-liter V6. Ahead of them, the V8 6-liter Chevrolet being driven by Tommy Kendall. Tremendous mechanical diversity in IMSA Camel GT Racing and tremendous driver experience. Rocky Moran just ahead of Jeff Brabham with a lot of Indianapolis 500 rides under his belt. Tom Kendall with four International Sports Associate, Motorsports Association racing championships in the last four years. The Intrepid with the Chevrolet normally aspirated engine being just outgunned down these long straights here at Watkins Glen. And Jeff Brabham manages to squeeze by both those cars on one lap. So now that leaves him the number 16 car. That's James Weaver. In Bob Dyson's Porsche, that's a brand new car. The yellow number 16 car at the lower left now out of your screen. And we have a long way to go, and the sun is peeking through the clouds. It's going to get hot. Tires and driver physique are going to be questions as the day goes on. Up front, Chip Robinson took a look at Davy Jones for second place and then tucked back in as they dive down into turn number one. Baron Schneider is your leader, followed by Jones, Robinson, and Fangio. A great lineup at the front, but watch out. Jeff Brabham is on his way. You're watching live the Camel Continental at Watkins Glen. Back live at Watkins Glen. There you see the number seven white Porsche of Baron Schneider of Germany lapping Tom Hessert's black Camel Lights car. Davy Jones right with him. There goes the red, white, and blue 84 Nissan of Chip Robinson, the 1987 series champion. And until today, the fastest lap holder in a North American circuit at 143 miles an hour until Bert Schneider took it away yesterday afternoon with 146. And they're lapping this afternoon at 145. As you can see, Bert Schneider using all of the road, plus a little bit more. That venerable Porsche 962. Uh, a new car, this admittedly, but nevertheless, uh, doing a sterling job this afternoon, holding up the very latest in high-tech equipment from Jaguar. Davy Jones in the number two car there. 
And of course, the number three guard, Chip Robinson there, the blue one, 84. Ooh, close Davey as Jones. they come through the S's. Right there on his gearbox. Davy Jones is one guy who does not like to follow. And that would sound like a fairly obvious statement when it comes to racing drivers, but a very special fire burns in that guy. But he and Bert Schneider are cast in the same mold. They are young, very, very gung ho, very determined young racing drivers. Ooh, underneath he goes. Even Davy had second thoughts about that one. With order restored once again, we talked with Baron Schneider before the weekend began and asked him about adapting his car, whether his car was as competitive here as he'd like it to be. Yeah, the cars here are much com more competitive than in Europe. In the circuit, that's a big difference to the, the European one. The uh, European one, they are faster and uh, the, the surface is more flat, flat and uh, this one is very bumpy. And uh, it's a it's a different to, to Europe, but uh, it's for everybody the same, and yeah, all the others have to find a good setup. And I think also we, we we can find a good setup for this circuit. Well, they found a good setup. Baron Schneider did that last lap at an average of 145 miles an hour, just one mile an hour, less than one mile an hour off his qualifying pace. But he was caught and passed in traffic by Davy Jones for the lead. Yeah, very, very heavy bit of traffic just there. Davey took advantage of that. He certainly is a very impulsive driver and also a man who takes the chances and when they're presented to him, he takes that. Ooh, someone putting the wheel right over the edge there. Tremendous closing speed with the Camel Lights and the Camel GTP cars on this short circuit at Watkins Glen. I'm not too sure, but it's the best place that we should race these cars together because the closing speeds are just absolutely horrendous and it puts a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the camel light drivers. Davy Jones quickly opening up a big lead. The Yost Porsche is in the pits along with this car, the number 80 machine that was leading in the camel lights class for a time. This is Martino Fanato and Ruggiero Melgrati. There you see Fanato, the gray haired man with his back to us. Now there you see the Yost team going to work. This has to be an unscheduled stop, but I don't see them going to tires. I wonder what that's about. You would think a tire going down or something, but they're not changing anything. Something must be wrong. Right? Maybe yeah. a vibration or something. Now they're going into the location of, well, it looks like maybe a front suspension problem. They'll change noses. Meanwhile, the race continues without them. The race leader is about to come around to the start finish line and put Baron Schneider a lap down. There you see the number two Bud Light Jaguar XJR 16 of Davy Jones. That's a shame. I could only surmise, and it is surmising, and probably Chris will find out for us that the nose has fractured underneath that Porsche and has caused a really serious vibration, which you get an aerodynamic vibration if the body comes apart. And this bumpy track may have fractured the front nose, and uh, which is why they're changing. He obviously hadn't run into anything. You can see it's okay, and it, but it could be that's what's wrong. Let's get down to the pit lane now with more from Dick Bergeron. Well, David Hobbs hit the nail right on the head. The nose had come loose, David, so they've changed noses. They're going to put this one on and hope this one stays on. That appears to be the only problem. It is, in fact, very bumpy out there. You can see on your screen the car shaking around, and they'd like to shake these cars right to pieces, and that's what's happened to this one. This car comes directly from Germany, where it's run in the German National Inter-Series. As it called, we got a car off the track. One of the Jaguars hard in the wall. And there's 83, there's Je Jeff Rabham too. And Raul Bozell, the number three Jaguar. You heard the screech of tires. They went off at tremendous speed. I think they're down in the turn five area. A corner taken at about 120 miles an hour. And Bozell backed that car very hard into the tire barrier. And I don't see Raul getting out of the car, which I would... Let's take another look at see. what happened there. It looks as though the rear... The, both the engine backwards. bonnet just came off. Either there was contact preliminarily or the engine bonnet came up. Ooh, he did hit that fence very hard. Luckily for him, backwards, as you say, the bonnet was up. And Jeff also appeared in the picture to the right going backwards. So whether they had just touched, whether Jeff ran into the back of it in some way and pushed it up, I don't know. But um, there's Raul Bozell moving around in the cockpit. But you know he just took a tremendous lick. We'll monitor Bozell's situation while we take a quick time out. We are showing a full course yellow in the Camel Continental at Watkins Glen, our first of the day. Stay with us. Back live at Watkins Glen with 12 laps complete in the Camel Continental. 
and we have just had a very scary accident. There you see where it happened in the high speed turn five. A very fast downhill right hander. Raul Bozell's number three Jaguar hard to the tire barrier. Let's take another look at it and listen to the sound of the tires. And more importantly, the sound of the crash as Raul Bozell backed it in. Now we're getting unofficial information that Bozell says he was hit by Jeff Brabham from the rear. There you see the number 83 car, and you see the broken headlight cover on the car. There was obviously contact between the two because both spun off the racetrack. Jeff Brabham charged through this field from the very back. By the fact that the left headlight, uh, that turn five, of course, is a right-hander, would indicate that Jeff tried to go down the inside uh, and clipped Pazell with his left front. Uh, and it looks like it pushed the bodywork. Thank goodness Raul Bassell certainly seems to be okay. You can see the shoulder strap he's got there, or neck strap, attached to his uniform. Oh, yeah, breathing a sigh of relief. Relief that he went in backwards and not frontwards. Chip Robinson has been in and out of the pits. Raul Bozell is out of the car and appears to be all right. There's Robinson's 84 being stopped at the end of the pit lane until the field passes. There is Raul Bozell talking to the emergency crews down in turn number five. Gonna check the pupils of his eyes for some dilation. He went hard backwards into the wall, gave his helmet a good wrap. Tough break for Raul Bozell. Raul Bozell not having the luckiest of years as we go inside David Tennyson's car, Camel Light car. This leading, is a, the, leading the field at the moment in Camel Lights. A three liter V8 Ferrari powered Spice Racer. Spice cars built in Great Britain and some of them in the United States are used by many teams in the Camel Lights class and you're going to see a lot of them in worldwide sports car competition next year when the series goes for a full three and a half liters. There is young David Tennyson at work. It's a good picture too. Youngest man at age 22 to win a Camel Lights race. He won in New Orleans two weeks ago, and he won an earlier round of this championship as well at Lime Rock, Connecticut, also seen here on ESPN. Wayne Taylor in the 64 car has taken advantage of the yellow flag and the pit stops and everything else to catch up with his teammate Tom Kendall, who started ahead of him on the grid. Wayne Taylor did not have a good practice or qualifying. As we heard him say on the grid, he had uh, problems with misfires and vibration. Let's hope that he's having a clearer run today. Um, he could do with a good win here or, or a good position here to try and drag himself up into the championship points. Davy Jones trailing behind the safety car is now the overall race leader. Let's get down to the pit lane in the Jaguar pits with Chris McClure. Tony, we understand your driver is out of the car apparently all right. Did he communicate before he got out of the machine? Yeah, he told me that uh, number 83 had uh, run into the back of him and pushed him off. And no chance of getting the car back around it. I know you were laid out or hoping for a pit stop a moment ago. Uh, no, no, no problem at all. Um, I didn't really understand the question, but uh, <laughs> the car is done for the yeah. day. Finished, yeah. You can't get it back here and fix it. Absolutely not. Thank you. Tony Dow, team manager for Jaguar. There you see the reason for his pessimism. The car hard into the back. Rear suspension deranged, as David might say. All of the body yeah. work gone, including the rear wing. Jaguar in the United States this year are just having the absolute foulest luck when it comes to crashes. Uh, Davy and uh, Raul have both crashed in practice and missed races because they haven't had enough spare machinery. And here's poor old Rizal, Raul uh, just into the fifth lap of the race, probably writing this car off as well. When I say writing off, that's a pretty loose term, but be a lot of damage done to that car. And the preliminary indications once again are that he got some help doing it. We are under caution at the Camel Continental at Watkins Glen's Davy Jones is your leader. Back at Watkins Glen and nearby Montour Falls just one of the beautiful sites that surround this area. A big vacation spot in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Bob Varsha and David Hobbs with you. Dick Bergren and Chris McClure are in the pits. We are under caution after a big shunt involving Raul Bozell for Jaguar. Let's get down to Dick now in the pits. Well, James Weaver is in with the new Rain-X Dyson Porsche, and he'd like to be under that waterfall about now. They've had a lot of trouble with this car. They've lost three turbos this week. They've lost the brakes right now, or before, rather. Right now, their problem is overheating. They've put some additional water in it. They're hoping it's not something major, but things should not be overheating this early in the race, and especially not with these cool temperatures. Great concern here in the Dyson pit. 
Mark Showman, the crew chief, and the rest of his team have worked long and hard to develop that totally new Porsche 962. They see Parker Johnstone in the Acura V6 powered Camel Lights car. He is now the Camel Lights leader. That is a situation he is very much accustomed to. He certainly is that indeed. The Acura engine has been incredibly reliable for him this year. And the whole package has done well because their very first time out late last year at Del Mar, uh, they took the Camel Light out with a Pontiac engine for the first time and won the class straight off. So uh, a very uh, strong team. And Parker Johnstone has driven very, very well all year. Upending himself last time you and I were together, of course, at Lime Rock when Wayne Taylor nudged him off the road and uh, flipped him onto his roof. And this is the same car that were flipped on the roof just uh, a few weeks back. Did a great job putting it all together again. They have a new car coming. They have tested some 10,000 miles in that car. And all of the car, all of the testing, all of the racing has come on this car. And virtually all the driving has been Parker Johnstone's. They've been testing like a Formula One team. Well, a very uh, professional team. And this weekend, they've got Tom Elliott, who's the uh, vice president of, Be of Honda North America, who's here watching over his racing charge. We are still under caution. We will be for a few short moments. So let's take a moment to take a closer look at this new Dyson Racing Porsche. Chris McClure has that story. A dozen victories makes Dyson Racing the winningest non-factory team active in GTP. The last of those was in the rain at Tampa last year. That was gratifying, but they knew they had to have a new car in order to stay near the front. We've been with Porsche a long time, and we were there for the heyday of Porsche. And then we kind of hate to look like we give up just because uh, the Porsche doesn't look competitive anymore. We believe it still is. So, I don't know, sometimes we think it's our duty. Construction of the new Porsche, dubbed DR2, began early last fall at Tucker George's Fab Car Shop. They hope to debut it early this season. Production delays spoiled that. Now it's ready. At first blush, driver James Weaver is pleased with the car. It's still very much a Porsche 962, which is a, a fabulous car. We've just tried to improve it a little bit in light of the latest developments in tyres and engines. So it's a little bit of work on the chassis, a bit on the aerodynamics. Nothing, nothing very outrageous, but a lot of subtle improvements. Improvements that gave the car stunning straight-line speed immediately at Watkins Glen, amid a series of broken turbos and brakes that slowed their progress. A great deal of work lies ahead. But this new Porsche has shown enough already to catch its share of attention. Racing here has gotten so intense, but yet in IMSA, you can borrow something from the Jaguar team or run to the Nissan team for help, and everybody works close together. So they're also good about admiring what you've done rather than condemning it, even though they might be scared of it. And uh, I think everybody's actually worried about this car, and that's mainly what I wanted. Brighter days ahead for Porsche in the hands of teams like Dyson Racing. We're going to have an extended yellow while corner workers repair the guardrail that was bent in that incredible backward shunt involving Raul Boisel's Jaguar. Your overall leader is Davy Jones. This car, the number 16 Porsche, runs in 10th position with Englishman James Weaver at the controls. We have no official word as yet how long this yellow flag will take. The lights are still on on the safety car here at the Glen, so there will be at least one more lap. We'll take a quick time out and return, hopefully in time for the green flag when racing resumes in the Camel Continental at Watkins Glen. Back live at Watkins Glen, New York, where Davy Jones leads the eighth running of the Camel Continental here at the Glen. Jones assumed the lead when the Porsche of Baron Schneider took an early pit stop to replace the nose that had been damaged on the bumps here at the racetrack. And then we had a huge carambulage involving Jeff Brabham and Raul Bozell. Brabham emerged relatively unscathed in his Nissan while Bozell backed it hard in the tire barriers, resulting in the yellow flag we are now under. Jeff Two Brabham's cars. left headlight cover's broken, which could aerodynamically affect that car down the front and of course could cause severe damage if it was to pull the nose off or tear the nose. With the headlights on, there you see the number 83 Nissan of the three-time series champion who started dead last in this field after blowing a turbocharger in the single-car qualifying session that sets the final grid. The safety car is now off. Davy Jones and his Bud Light Jaguar number two comes rocketing off the corner. Jim Sidley waves the green, and we're underway once again. It is Jones followed by Juan Fangio and the number 99 white Toyota at the back of your screen. 
then Tom Kendall, Wayne Taylor, and Jeff Klein in the top five. Davy Jones just rockets away through turn two. Well, luckily for him, he had some camel lights and some slower GTP cars between himself and his immediate pursuers on the track. So on the road, he had Hotchkiss for one in front of the other guys. He took advantage of that, and as you can see, just half a lap down has scored a huge uh, jump on his competitors. It's a very cool and overcast day here at Watkins Glen if you're just joining us, but it is expected to stay dry. With three victories this year, but as David mentioned earlier, some rotten luck that has held him back a little bit in the points. He is presently in third place, 18 points behind overall leader Chip Robinson. There are 20 points for a victory, one point for pole, one point for fast lap of the race, and one point for leading the most laps. If you do all three, you get two extra bonus points. If you win the race, that gives you a total of 25 points. There you see the 10 card of Hotchkiss, 65 and 64, the Intrepid. Then the field bunches up behind the uh, Moretti car there, the red and yellow car. A new Gebhard chassis with a five-cylinder turbocharged Audi engine. 64, that's Wayne Taylor. He won the race two weeks ago in New Orleans. The Intrepid just a little bit down for power here. Tremendous downforce on these cars, which is great uh, for some parts of this track, but I think on this long straight here, they just lose out a little bit too much for the race. Just how much speed do they lose? Well, we already know about Bernd Schneider's top speed of 212 miles an hour on the back stretch here at Watkins Glen. During qualifying, the best the Intrepids could do was 180 miles an hour by Wayne Taylor. So that's a cool 32 miles an hour slow. It won't be quite that bad in the race, that's for sure. There's the, Brab the Nissan 83 car, Jeff Brabham, going around. Brabham picked up 11 cars on the first lap, and he continues his charge. Let's get to Chris McClure in the pit lane. Watching for Jeff Brabham to come around is his crew chief, Bob Sproul. There he goes. He makes his pass in front. Bob, was he able to explain to you what happened in the incident? No, uh, his radio dice is not working, but I asked him if the car was all right, and he said everything was fine. He's got a damaged headlight cover, so I imagine they, they must have touched somewhere. No indication that there is damage. You got a signal from him when he came into the pits, is that correct? Everything's fine. Everything is fine, so that's the report from Jeff Brabham, but he cannot talk to his crew chief. They can talk to him. Well, he certainly seems to be much faster than his teammate, Chip Robinson, who they started off together under that caution flag, and in that first lap, Jeff Brabham took, put an incredible round of daylight between himself and his teammate. Brabham has moved up from 24th to 8th, and that includes a pit stop after coming together with Raul Boisel to check the car over. There you see the yellow Porsche of James Weaver, still suffering overheating problems, we understand. There is Chip Robinson in the number 84 Nissan. Robinson running one place on the racetrack behind his teammate, eighth and ninth. <laughs> this is a track that's been very good to the Nissan team over the years. They've won their last three races here, whereas Toyota and Jaguar are looking for their first victories on this track. Chip Robinson in the 84 car, catching up with the yellow 16, the Rain-X car that we saw just a few moments ago. There's Chip in the car, concentrating on the job in hand. Chip's getting a lot of time behind the wheel this year. Not only his Nissan NBTI 90 race car, he's also driving a motor coach throughout the entire Camel GT series this year. He figures he'll rack up well over 10,000 miles of driving, and he says he's never had more fun in his life. Swooping through that turn five, very, very long corner. Slowly making ground on James Weaver, driving the 16 car, which is the Porsche built down in Georgia. You can see that car bouncing around as they go into that turn six. Very rough there. Let's get more from Dick Bergren in the pits. Well, James Weaver's team right now is watching a computer screen here in the pits. The computer screen is reading back here to the pits the engine temperature. Car owner Rob Dyson, what is it telling you? Well, it's not necessarily a happy story. That's why we're monitoring it a little closer than we normally do. We have a little bit of a problem. We're leaking a little bit of water, it seems. So it's kind of going into one of the cylinders. We're trying to follow it now to see if it's something we can solve. Sounds like a cracked cylinder head. That's pretty unsolvable. Well, we're not sure what it is. We're, we're assessing it right now. But hopefully we can keep the Renex portion in the show and uh, try to do our best. But it's, it might be a pretty short day for us. We'll... We'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, they've all got their eyes glued on the temperature screen here in the pits, and I'm sure Weaver's watching it in his car as well. 
New Car Blues for Rob Dyson's Porsche contingent, who won their very first time out with a Porsche 962 in Lime Rock, Connecticut a few years back. They have been stalwarts ever since. Davy Jones makes his way out of the picture. There you see the gap, about a second and a half to the number 99 All-American Racers Toyota Eagle of Juan Fangio II, just about a month ago, became a new daddy for the first time. They've had mixed fortunes. Uh, last year, they had some tremendously strong showings. Then at the beginning part of this year, the car seemed to have gone off the pace quite a bit, but they've been away, done a bit of development work. They also got a brand new car waiting in the wings. But nevertheless, here in one place where you'd think that power be a premium, uh, the cars are doing extremely well this weekend. They are looking forward to introducing their newest Eagle derivative, which we expect to see a little bit later in the year as testing progresses. Dan Gurney, one of the legends in motorsports, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. The action continues live from Watkins Glen in just a moment. Back live at Watkins Glen. There you see a clutch of Camel Lights competitors in action. The number 80 of Ruggiero Milgarati goes underneath. The number 19 of David Tennyson, who is the overall leader. Now the 80 car is ahead of the 19 on the racetrack, but not in the race. They had a long pit stop for an engine misfire. And they are not shown running on the same lap with the overall class leader. There in the front of your screen with the headlights on is the overall race leader, Davy Jones. But the battle is between David Tennyson in that number 19 machine and the man just behind him, Parker Johnstone, in the number 48 white and orange Acura Spice race car. These guys put on a good show. <coughs> there you see the picture out of Tennyson's car. It's a Jaguar sweep by on the straight. There's the 48, the Acura Spice behind them as they go through turn one. Coming into the fastest turns in the corner now, and of course, two, three, and four. Interesting how the bodywork of the car pops up and down under the pressure of the air. In the middle of it is a black snorkel that provides air, I would guess, to the engine of the rear brakes. Well, you see that, Bob? That's not the body going up down, that's the suspension. That's attached to the suspension, the rear suspension. And it's the brake duct. Well, something is going up and down. Going good, yeah. and right now, Parker Johnston is going around David Tennyson for first place in the Camel Lights class. Good pass there as they go into that long turn five complex and pulls away. Interesting to see, though, the uh, Ferrari engine spice leading both of them. As we say, leading them on the road as we see it now, but in fact a long way down because they had a misfire. Must have had a plug lead loose or something because it doesn't seem to be having a misfire now. No. Oh, one of the Nissans is off again. Once again, I believe this is in turn five. Is it the 83 yeah. car? No, it's Chip Robinson this time. So Robinson takes his turn in the dirt. Chip Robinson, if you remember, had a huge accident back there in 1987, coming down the back straight and just drove straight off when he was driving the Al Holbert Porsche. And uh, I'll, let's see it again. We might be able to. Coming just inside of James Weaver, and they touch. I'm amazed that Weaver didn't go around, but Chip does. As David mentioned, this was a place on the racetrack. He had a huge crash when something broke on the Porsche. He went straight on into the tires. The car was an absolute wreck, and yet he limped it back to the pits. And when one of our ESPN announcers asked him why, he said, I just had to bring it back. That's a race driver, folks. Well, it doesn't seem to have done any damage. That spin, I can't imagine, it didn't flat spot his tires. Uh, but if they're not too bad, he'll want to try and continue until he needs a fuel stop. A little nudge there, trying to go around the, on the inside. Of course, the front of his car just caught the heavier rear end of the Porsche, and it pushed his front end in more than it pushed James Weaver's rear end out, uh, sending him into that spin. Good spin, 360-degree uh, spin uh, onto the grass, and slotted in gear, and just drove off. There you see Davy Jones race average down considerably after that long yellow flag for Raul Bozell's crash. Juan Fangio coming around Derek Bell in that brand new Momo Audi powered machine. And there is a look back to the third place car, the number 65 of Tommy Kendall. I tell you, I'm uh, impressed with the way the 99 Fangio is going. I thought that um, the Jaguar would be putting a lot more ground between them. There you see Jeff Brabham now up to fourth spot. Going through turn five, where his teammate just had the big spin. Jeff is just crushing his way through this field. He's now up to fourth place. Behind him is Weaver, and then Rocky Moran, as you look on, Jeff Brabham. So Brabham will now be heading, setting up in hot pursuit of Tom Kendall in the 65 car. 
and the way he's going at the moment, it can only be a matter of time and not a long time at that before he catches him up. Those big snorkels on either side of the cockpit have been added to the Nissan for this race to add extra force of air to the turbochargers. There you see Parker Johnstone, 30 years of age from Redmond, Oregon, making the most of his opportunity in prototype sports car racing. He is absolutely dominating the class, but this Acura Spice team is doing their best to win a very close race against the Ferraris and Buick powered cars for the manufacturer's honors. Looking back a little bit further in the field. There you see Wayne Taylor, the number 64 car, that V8 normally aspirated Chevrolet powered Intrepid from the Miller Racing Team running in seventh position. Weaving his way through traffic. Chip Robinson comes up on the inside of him at the same place going to the turn five. Executes a, a, a much cleaner pass. Really not so much on breaking that. That's just pure straight line speed. He got him really because of vastly superior speed down the straight as we saw in qualifying. Nearly 30 miles off the pace, the 64 and 65 car. Um, but a lot of downforce and very quick. I think they'll be extremely quick in a couple of weeks' time out at Laguna Seca. Very much a street racer or a tight racetrack car for places like Laguna Seca. Places like Road Atlanta, Road America, and here at Watkins Glen, they are down a little bit on top end speed. I'm sure they wish even more than anybody else. Most of the drivers here wish they were racing on the long course. I'm sure that if anybody does, they do. Look at the 99 car. I'll swear that he's catching the Jaguar up again. He is. Considering you remember the Jaguar after that long yellow, Davey took advantage of a great start, rocketed away, and Banjo is winding him in. The pole sitting Yost Porsche has now pitted once again. They're obviously having problems with that car. They were in 12th place, but they've come into the pits once again. Davey Jones with about a second over this man with a 99, Dan Gurney, All-American Racers, Toyota Eagle, Juan Fangio the second. Nephew of the five time world champion from Argentina. We'll monitor that gap as it closes down. Davy Jones may soon have company on the point. We'll be right back to Watkins Glen. Back live at Watkins Glen with headlights on. The number two Bud Light Jaguar of Davy Jones is the leader, but he is coming under fire from the card. Two cars back, the white number 99 Toyota of Juan Fangio II. We're just over 41 minutes into this two and a half hour race. We should correct something we said earlier. It's not a 150 lap race, it's a 150 minute race. We are now 41 minutes in on our live coverage. There is Fangio. Quite heavy uh, back marker traffic there. Dave is now caught behind somebody. Uh, Fangio was caught behind uh, a couple of cars going through two and three. There you see that Toyota bouncing around. There's the 30 car, Giampiero Moretti. Looks like he's pulled into the pits. Not at all happy with his new Gebhard car. I think he wishes now that maybe he should have bought a Spice. It's a great looking car though. God, it looks great, doesn't it? It looks tremendous, yeah. Yeah, see whether they just need a power plant and a little bit of aerodynamics to make it go. There is Davy Jones whistling down through turn number one, about to overtake da uh, David Tennyson, in the second place Camel Lights car going outside through the S's. Bold move there. Saw the second place car of Fangio go by. We'll pick up the third place machine. There is Tommy Kendall hanging in, admittedly down on top end speed with this beautiful Chevy known as an Intrepid, designed by Bob Riley, who is a legendary car builder. Designed many of the Trans Am and GTO sedan cars. There you see Tom Kendall. Don't let that Doogie Hauser smile fool you. He is all business of the race car. Now there you see the uh, Momo car with that Audi power plant back on the racetrack. Now back to Tommy Kendall. That was a quick move on the part of the uh, Momo car. I thought uh, he opened the door in the pit area. It looked like he was about to abandon ship and then a few seconds later he's back on the track. There's Jeff Brabham. The number 83 car still shown in fourth place. Eight cars still on the lead lap. About to come up and lap the number 18 Camel Lights car of Andy Evans and Hugh Fuller. Part of a new two car Camel Lights team at IMSA Camel GT Racing. There is Jeff Brabham, the three time champion. Wife Rosina is here looking on. He tries to fight his way back into this championship. He trails his teammate Chip Robinson by three points. Going around the outside of that camel line through the, those 
very fast corners there. Jeff is another one of those very easygoing guys outside of the car, but you get him in and he just rockets. Someone once asked Jeff Brabham, do you go out and walk the course or ride it on a bicycle or drive it in a rent a car in order to get a feeling for it? He said, no, I get in and I see it on my warm up lap and off we go. That's about right. Into the turn six area, watch the car bounce around here. He hits those bumps on the way in. Back wing flapping, body work working. These cars have got to be well and truly put together because this is the sort of course that can literally break them up even if you don't hit early. It is Jones, Fangio, Tom Kendall, and Jeff Brabham in the top four. There you see Tommy Kendall. With that great looking new car, eventually destined for customer uses. We may see many of these cars in Camel GT racing in the future. And one of its unique elements is power steering. No other car in the field except these Intrepids has power steering. And we asked Tommy before the race how much it would help him. I think it'll, it's gonna, that's going to be probably the biggest difference of anything. You know, there's been a few times where you're trying different things gear wise and sometimes you don't get your hand back on the wheel and in a car without power steering you just can't do it. But I was thinking of just kind of for kicks uh, to throw out at the driver's meeting or leak it out to some of the other teams. Uh, I think we could probably run a uh, minute one second flat with one hand on the wheel. So uh, yeah, I, I certainly want, wouldn't want to try that, but the, there is zero steering effort. So you take all that fatigue away and you still have to deal with the heat and the G-forces, but that's one less uh, stress on the body. And he's not kidding about G-forces. Some of these cars pulling three and a half Gs sustained through these corners. Well, of course, the Intrepid pulling probably more G-force than anybody else, but we saw Raul Bussell when he got out of his wrecked car that he had a strap on his left shoulder, which of course was to hold his head up because of the preponderance of long right-hand corners here. Very hard to hold your head up after an hour or more. Now there is Chip Robinson, who has been off the track once in the 84 Nissan. Let's get more on his situation with Chris McClure. With crew chief Peter Scott. Peter, first of all, was he able to uh, give his side of the moment a while back? Uh, no, he's just been getting down to business. He hasn't really said much. We just asked him if the car was okay. He acknowledged, so he's just trying to get back down to business again. And the, the lap times are confirming what he says. The car is all right. Yeah, times are all right. It, it's good, if not better than he's been doing at the start of the race. So everything must be all right. He did get it around. He didn't say anything about flat spotting or, or messing up his tires. No, that's what I was concerned about. Because if he had had to come in for tires, that would have really thrown out strategy out the window. But everything seems all right. In a race like this, as you take a look there at Chip Robinson, just two and a half hours long, these teams are planning just two pit stops, by and large, and if you get off your pit schedule and need to stop, say, a third time, it can really throw off your chances of winning the race when the rest of the field is lapping at about a minute per lap. Well, the thing is that Chip Robinson here in the 84 car had that big spin. There was a full 360-degree spin. He may have flat spotted his tires a bit, and even if the car is vibrating, he's going to stick it out because, like his crew chief said, he doesn't want to come in out of sync and spoil their strategy. A tough call to make because when you've spun across the grass at over 100 miles an hour, that vibration could be a lot of things. He'll be thinking to himself, it's most probably flat spots. Chip Robinson continues on his way, lapping a couple of the slower Campbell Lights cars. The action continues in two classes, live here at Watkins Glen. Baby Jones is leading. Back live, 50 minutes into the two and a half hour Camel Continental 8 at Watkins Glen. There you see the battle for the lead in Camel Lights. The number 19 Ferrari powered Spice of David Tennyson, who just took over the lead from Parker Johnstone's Acura powered Spice. Let's take another look at the pass. On the front straightaway, past the pits, James Weaver in the yellow Porsche moves over. But Tennyson got a great head of steam up and came right around Parker Johnstone. Two very evenly matched cars. Very evenly matched. <coughs> Parker Johnstone, of course, is going to be driving with a certain bit of reserve this afternoon because if he can win this class today, he could conceivably wrap up the championship for the year. Obviously, if he comes second, it's no uh, huge threat to his uh, ultimate uh, ambition to, to win the championship this year. So he's going to be driving very conservatively. What he doesn't want to do is drop out and not score any points at all. Six victories thus far this year for Parker Johnstone. He leads David Tennyson 179 to 94 in championship points. As David said, that 
pretty much sews up the driver's championship for Parker Johnstone, but not at all the manufacturer's title. And that's what that team, headed by Don Erb and Doug Peterson for Parker Johnstone, want most desperately is to win that title in Acura's debut season at Campbell GT Racing. And they say that somewhere down the road, there may be a full-blown GTP effort with Japanese Honda power. And that means, perhaps, the 10-cylinder Formula One engine being used by the Tyrrell squad this year. That certainly is a dream that they would all love to aspire to. And of course, uh, that all is a boardroom decision that has to be made uh, <laughs> at the very highest level. But meanwhile, they're going to do their bit and try and win the championship with what they're trying to do this year, which is the Camel Light Division. There's the number 98 Toyota. That is Rocky Moran from California. He is presently in sixth place. Willie T. Ribs, who's having so much fun in the Card IndyCar series this year, is a backup driver for both Juan Fangio and Rocky Moran at this race. There's number 84, Chip Robinson, shown seventh. The top ten are Davy Jones of the Jaguar, Fangio's Toyota, Tommy Kendall in the Chevy-powered Intrepid, Jeff Brabham's Nissan, James Weaver in the Porsche, followed by Rocky Moran's Toyota, Chip Robinson of the Nissan, and then Wayne Taylor, one lap down now in his Chevy-powered Intrepid. Rocky Moran in the 98 car there is about to put number 16, James Weaver, away. As we know, Weaver's having problems with water getting into the engine. He's, he's running hot and probably, obviously, down on power a bit. But meanwhile, the uh, Toyota is having a great afternoon so far. It's not over yet by any means, but second and sixth, second and soon to be fifth. Very good display at this high-speed circuit. Here is the running order with 39 laps complete, 52 and a half minutes roughly into the two and a half hour race. Of the 24 cars that started, two are officially out. The number three Jaguar of Raul Bozell, who crashed hard, and Jim Pace from Jackson, Mississippi, in his Buick-powered Kudzu racer with electrical problems. There we see that uh, race for fifth spot between James Weaver and Rocky Moran in the 98 car around a, a Camel light car. They come up to that turn six, that bumpy turn six area, both hit the bump, boom, boom, boom. Very difficult to brake hard, you know, on that sort of surface. The brakes want to lock up, and a lot of wheel snatching goes on. The steering, of course, dances around in your hands, which would be a big advantage for the Intrepids. It would take away a lot of that steering feedback, of course, with the power steering that they and only they run. Moran inexorably closing it on the 16 car. Toyota team was plagued with engine management difficulties in the fuel area earlier this year. They also, as we mentioned earlier, are developing their totally new Toyota Eagle race car using the same engine. And as a result, developing one car and racing another has cost them a lot. There you see Davy Jones, whose lead is now almost a full five seconds over Juan Fangio. So Fangio, who was closing in for several laps, now seems to be dropping back some. Now either Davy's picked up the pace or Fangio slowed up, we're not quite sure <coughs> which yet, but anyway. On the back stretch, there you see the gap at the back of your picture. Davy Jones in the foreground is your leader. Here comes Juan Fangio. Still looking strong. Round turn five, that's the sort of place where you need one of those head uh, straps to hold your head up. Because these cars develop tremendous G-force around here. We know the Intrep is developing at least three and a half Gs. And uh, that's what I call a neck stretcher. There we see the Intrepid, number 65. No, that's the number 64 car, Wayne Taylor. Wayne has had a terrible weekend. He's about to be lapped by his teammate. And they just cannot get that car running right at all. Misfiring, vibration, just problems, problems all weekend. Let's get pit action now with Dick Bergeron. Uh, Juan Fangio is in right now. He has been running in second spot. This is a planned pit stop. It's inside the window. They're doing this in plenty of time. Four tires. They're going to take on a load of fuel and send him off and on his way. He is the first of the front runners to pit. All the rest are going to have to be in very soon. That was a 22-31 pit stop. Good stop for Fangio and company. Very good stop indeed. Bouncing his way down the pit road there. Out onto the track. Joins it just below turn one. Slides into the traffic, which there isn't any of, as he goes into turn two. Makes sliding in a lot easier. That makes sliding a lot easier. Turn two, of course, used to be the site of the infamous chicane. There's 16 James Weaver into the pits. 
And if they've got a problem with overheating, this is the sort of thing that could just about finish it off when you stop in the pit. Putting more water in the car, probably with that hose in the cockpit there. It could be a pressure. <coughs> pressure fed water system. Davy Jones did not stop that lap. Can't be long before he brings the Jaguar V6 in for its uh, routine maintenance stop. Raul Bozell already being out of the race. The entire Jaguar team will concentrate its efforts on this man, Davy Jones. We'll try to pick up the interval back to second place. Davy works his way That's around. Right. Andy Evans in the 18 car. Ooh, that was a bit hairy, didn't it? Quite. Closing speeds here are tremendous. And that's the reason many of the Someone drivers... Slowing the down there, is that? Who's that going very slowly? Looks what? like one of the uh, spice cars in the GTP one of the Appleby cars, I believe. I think so. Either the four or five machine for Jeff Perner or Jeff Klein. The 64 car of Wayne Taylor let, let his teammate through. I don't think he probably realized just how slowly that spice was going. Um, 65, is he going to stop? No, he goes on. Maybe 64 will stop. No, nope. 64 goes by too. All other things being equal, these two cars will probably get a little bit better fuel mileage than their turbocharged colleagues. See them using the spats over the rear wheels to provide a little extra measure of aerodynamic efficiency. That was a move pioneered by the Jaguar team, although they don't use them, interestingly, on their new turbo cars, the XJR-16s. Tommy Kendall continues on his way. There is the number five machine. Now that was started by Jeff Klein from Malibu, California. Jeff, one of the great drivers in Camel GT history, has won with over a dozen different co-drivers over the years. And this team working with a more standard small block Chevy engine. There you see the team car, the number four machine, I believe was started by Jeff Kerner. Brian Bonner from the Boston area will also be climbing in for Tom Milner, who bases his team in Virginia. And the number seven car of Bernd Schneider putting that car down. Schneider has got a lot of ground to make up now. He's over a lap down on the leader, having got off to a great start. We believe one of his problems at the start was that he'd done such an electrifying qualifying yesterday afternoon that he rather put his tires through the ringer. And of course, in IMSA racing, you have to start the race on the tires with which you qualify. Uh, obviously, to avoid having this qualifying tire nightmare. Uh, but apparently he didn't do his tires much good yesterday afternoon, which is why he made an early pit stop. There is Davy Jones, headlights on, in order to alert the slower cars ahead of him that he's coming through. Jaguar, one of the stiffest cars here, as you can see, bouncing around possibly even more than pretty well anything else. Coming into the pit. Let me correct myself. I said they don't use those rear tire spats. Obviously they do. He's headed for the pit and Dick Bergren is there. Well, there is pit work going on. It's quite a ways up pit road. One of the Jaguars is in. They're changing four tires on that car right now. He's the only one of the cars that's taking service at this point. Meanwhile, James Weaver is coming in. The word we've got is the car is overheated and they're going to park it. Oh, tough break for Rob Dyson's team. James Weaver has made his way in. Actually, the John Hotchkiss, Jim Adams, Pontiac Spice has also parked, but it looks like the driver is out of that car. Might be done for the day as well as Davy Jones gives it a wheel spinning pit exit, and he has got the tear fish tailing all the way down to pit lane. A lot of dust down the pit lane, and it's concrete, so not so much grip as there is on the tarmac anyway. That was a very electrifying start from our Davy. And that's one of the things that the Jaguar team loves about Davy. The idea is you go out there as a race driver, just bring me back the steering wheel as long as you win, and that is the essence of Davy Jones, the absolute charger. See about a lead change now that Davy has pitted. There is Tommy Kendall taking the first lead of the day for the V8 Chevy powered Intrepid designed by Bob Riley, built in the shops of the Mil MCI Miller Racing Team in Michigan. Did you an idea there? Not, not just the closing speed down the straight, but the incredible speed through the corners of these more powerful, uh, more downforce GTP cars over the Camel Lights. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Chevrolet's involvement in this form of racing and others. The story 
written by Tom Higgins from the Charlotte area, reported in the newspapers here in the Corning, New York area. General Motors is going to reorganize all of its motorsports effort in IndyCar, Winston Cup racing, sports car racing, and it may have a dramatic impact on all forms of motor racing in America. It's a story we're going to want to follow as the weeks move on through the summer. We'll take a quick time out right now and return to live Camel GT action from Watkins Glen. Live at Watkins Glen, six cars on the lead lap as the pit stops continue among the leaders in the Camel Continental. There you see the number 83 of Jeff Brabham, who's had a very eventful day. Contact with the Jaguar of Raul Bozell spinning off the racetrack. Started dead last in the field and moving up. At the bottom of your screen, Parker Johnstone made a move for the Camel Lights lead. This is Wayne Taylor with his Chevy Intrepid in the pits. Here's Dick Bergeron. He is, and he's doing a good job. Both the pit stops for the Intrepid cars have been well done. Kendall has come and gone in a very fast pit stop. Taylor now on his way. That's all the front three cars have now pitted. Great sound from that big Chevy power plant. This is really a nice race car. Of course, the amazing thing about our race leader, 83, you say he's had an eventful afternoon. Of course, he started this race just an hour ago, absolutely dead bomb last. Came up, had a big spin himself, spun poor old Raul Bazell into the fence, put Raul Bazell out, had a huge spin himself, came in, had a precautionary pit stop to have a look at the damage, went off again, caught it flat, here he is, leading the race. <laughs> Pretty good afternoon, I'd say, one way or another. Kind of race we expect out of Jeff Brabham after all the victories over the years. There's Parker Johnstone, who, as you can see, has retaken the lead in the Camel Lights class from David Tennyson, but they remain very close together. That's the look Tennyson has of the race leader just ahead of him. As they go down that main straight, come to the end of the straight, 155 mile an hour on, turn into that long right-hander there, turn five. There's the old course going off to the right of the picture there, which would be the long course. In a moment, that's see where it rejoins. We're having a little problem because of all the cloud cover here. We can't get our helicopter as high as we need to to bounce the signals from the onboard cameras up there. We'll keep working on that. There from the outside is 22-year-old David Tennyson. Getting a wheel up on the left. Very tricky corner, that corner seven on the short course here at the Glen. Slightly banked, you can really rock it into it, but then it spills you out onto the front straightaway and levels out right away. Down into the S's goes Tennyson in pursuit of Parker Johnstone and in pursuit of the Camel Lights lead. The most improved driver in the class a year ago was David Tennyson. There is your overall race leader, Jeff Brabham. Be interesting to see when he stops. As David mentioned, he made an early stop after his spin. I'm sure they did some kind of routine service while they checked out the car for damage. Now that would put him off of his pit stop schedule, and Jeff, as a result, might need three stops to make it through this race. We'll have to watch and see. Well, of course, that first precautionary stop will count as a stop against him, yes, and, and he's, but he still will almost certainly need to stop two times more because it happened so early in the race. Brabham, your overall race leader. Fangio running in second place. We'll take a look back at the interval, and as you can see, it is a big one. These are the two lights cars. Parker Johnstone on the number 48, then the 19 of David Tennyson. There is the number 99 of Juan Manuel Fangio II running in second place, followed right there with headlights on by Davy Jones. So there's second and third on the track. The 99 Toyota. And the number two Jaguar of D. Jones, who learned everything he knows from the knee of his favorite uncle. That former teammate with the BMW Camel GT team. Former teammate, guru, mentor, tormentor. There you see Juan Fangio, and there is Davy Jones, who took the only victory for that BMW team, in spite of the presence of so much wisdom and experience. Took it right here. And he, and I, he and I shared the front row back in 86, and he rocketed off into the lead, which he was never to relinquish. He and, of course, young John Andretti, who's having such a good year in IndyCar racing this year. <clears throat> in fact, that reminds me, they both owe me a dinner, because they were down and out impoverished drivers in those days. Now they're not. <laughs> no, they're not indeed. Let's get more from Chris McClure in the pit lane. Well, as you mentioned a while ago, Davy Jones really lit him up going out of the pits. 
a problem maybe. As he was getting his service, this fell off a crewman and went on the ground. And when he lit him up, it went under the tire. Part of it came back actually and hit me in the chest. It went under the tire, asked the tire people, would that mess up that drive tire in the back? And they said, we sure hope not. We'll see. Dick Bergeron has more at the other end of the pit. Yeah, David Tennyson is in now making his first routine stop. Remember, he's the gentleman that was worried about his tires. They've taken the first set of four off. I see no blisters on any of them. This cool day has been a big gift for David Tennyson, who was having trouble running three or four laps without blistering a tire in warmer temperatures. Tennyson's service is over. He's in gear. He's on. I'm sure that also to help his blistering problem, they probably put a bit more downforce in the car to stop it sliding around quite so much. Uh, which obviously is one of the quickest ways to blister your tires. Great sound of that Ferrari V8, David Tennyson's Denon America spice machine. Isn't that kind of early though for a camel light stop? Should only make one stop, these guys. Most of the camel lights teams, that's right, are planning only one stop, so that could be a little bit early. That tire problem may be the end of David Tennyson's effort. In the background, you see the number 99 of Juan Fangio, second place behind him, the orange visor there on the number two Jaguar of Davy Jones, second and third in the race. Meanwhile, in the pit lane, Rocky Moran has made his stop. And he is back on the racetrack, or will be momentarily as he makes his way down the pit lane. Now let's go back down in the pits and Chris McClure. Jeff Brabham has arrived and he's getting the service regularly scheduled. They told us this would be the time a few moments ago. No problems from earlier on as he charged through the field. He's getting four tires. They are uh, still up on the jacks. The tires are now completed. The fuel is complete and the 83 Nissan is away. In a cloud of dust with a hearty high O silver, Jeff Brabham, the three-time champion, is on his way. That is just 68 minutes into the race. Now, that's his second stop, the first one he had to make because of his crash. This one he has to make for routine service, so Jeff will definitely have to stop twice more in this race, I would guess. And the pit strategy could very well be an important element in the ultimate victory today worth more than $50,000 at Camel Continental 8. We'll be back with more live action in a moment. Back live at Watkins Glen, we've had another big crash in the Turn 5 area. It's one of the Chevrolet-powered Intrepid cars, either Tommy Kendall or Wayne Taylor. It's the 65 car, and that is Kendall. Let's take another look. Trailing Jeff Brabham's Nissan into the corner. And the car just comes around. One of the rear wheel spats come. The yeah, rear wheel like, came off. Rear wheel came right off the car, and this is a hard hit. Oh. Good grief, that was a horribly hard hit. The wheel came off, you saw it push the wheel spat out of the way, uh, loaded the wheel up as he turned right into that corner, the left rear wheel came off. There you see the area on the map, the turn five. Turn in there in these high downforce cars, probably 145 miles an hour, maybe 150 even. Corner workers gesturing for help. We have a full course caution. Tommy Kendall is a very tall driver, so his legs stick right out into the front of that car. Tommy is about six feet, six inches tall. And the first thing you think about is leg injuries and a head-on impact like that. Now they're calling for first aid help. You can see the roll cage exposed at the top of the car where the bodywork came off. Corner workers obviously communicating with Kendall, or trying to. From La Cañada, California, Tommy Kendall looking forward to getting married this fall. Here's another look, and watch for the rear wheel to detach from the car. Heavy stress on the left side of the car at this point. Rear end starts to come around because of the loss of one of the wheels. Some, there's some, some kind of a flame or that's, some sort that's of... That's where the upright hit the floor, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. The wheel on its own, of course, this is another thing that could have been dangerous. It jumps right over the fence as the car itself does the most tremendous pirouette. It hits right on his side, the left front, the right front corner, hit those tire barriers. And, of course, thank goodness for the tire barrier. Soaks up a tremendous amount of energy. 
Reports from the coroners that Tommy is conscious. They're in the foreground with the blue light as a yellow Porsche provided by Porsche North America to IMSA for use as a rapid response vehicle. It carries important life-saving equipment Not and a qualified position, <clears throat> right, driven by a licensed race driver to get to the scene of an accident in a hurry. So we have a serious accident here involving 24-year-old Tommy Kendall, who is reported to be conscious in the car. They're working on him. We'll take a quick time out and return to Watkins Glen. Track facts are brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. The variety of courses GTPs run on demand a variety of aerodynamic packages. Case in point, the Jaguar front end assembly. Now back at West Palm Beach with the XJR10, Davy Jones got a wider front. That gave him more downforce, helped him turn into the corners a little bit better, and he won the race. The XJR16 came out at Atlanta, and by Topeka, they decided they wanted even further downforce. Still the wider front end, but the birth of the bib came at Topeka. A fitting that went right in here on both sides, make the front end wider. Again, more downforce, better turning in. By mid-Ohio, they decided they wanted a lot more downforce. So, they built this extra wing for the front of the car. Went on about like this. Worked like a charm as Davy Jones dominated the day and won going away. A lot of variety with Jaguar and the other competitors on the front end assemblies in 1991. There you see the turn five area where an enormous crash involving Tommy Kendall in the number 65 Chevrolet Intrepid. He is reported to be conscious in the car, but they are having to cut the car apart to get Tommy out. Some six foot six inches tall with a newly issued degree in economics from the University of California at Los Angeles. 24-year-old Tommy Kendall plans to be married this fall. This is his first major career accident, and it was a big one. The car began to swing around when apparently something broke in the left rear. The car spun 360 degrees and plowed headfirst into the tire barrier at virtually unabated speed. We are under a full course caution. The leader in the race is now the number 99 Toyota, Juan Manuel Fangio II, the fifth different leader we've had thus far today. And the first time that a Toyota has led a race in the 1991 season. I certainly feel for Tommy Kendall back in 1972. Uh, <clears throat> I was coming up to that similar spot in a Formula 5000 car. In those days, we were doing about 175, and as I crested the rise going into that right hand and put the brakes on, half of the right rear suspension became unattached from the car, which did an immediate pirouette into the guardrail. And I must say that I've made thanks then to Jackie Stewart, who had been instrumental in getting guardrail, put all around these tracks. Everybody said, oh, that guardrail itself is dangerous, but I tell you what, it saved my bacon because it would either hit the guardrail or disappear into the trees. And... Um, I think that you'll find it's a hell of a lot safer to hit the guardrail, especially when it's got the extra protection of those tire barriers that Tommy Kendall ran into, than it would have been just to take your chance in the open countryside. Jackie Stewart is present this weekend here at the Glen, representing Bridgestone Tires and some of their marketing activities. Drove the pace car and some of the other support races here today, and a longtime campaigner for safety in motorsports. And this was one of the circuits that really benefited from it. All this guardrail pretty much a direct result of Jackie Stewart and the late Joe Bonnier's activities back in the uh, very early 70s. Let's take another look now at the wreck involving Tommy Kendall in the number 65 blue, yellow, and white car to the right of your screen, following Jeff Brabham with headlights on through the corner. Watch the rear wheel on this side. Turns into the corner. Now, this is where he's developing this three and a half Gs we're talking about. So those tires are developing huge grip Either the tire comes off or something breaks. You can see the sparks underneath as the upright or the bottom of the car drags along the road. The wheel itself comes off. The car spins right around, goes through that 360 degrees, unlike Bissell. And, of course, his corner right there rams straight into the guardrail. And at that point, he must have been going still at least 100 miles an hour. Tremendous amount of energy dissipated in just a few inches. 
Uh, tremendous deceleration on his body, even if he's strapped in and the car doesn't deform completely. Uh, the human body stopping at that sort of speed, it's not good for it. Dick Bergman is standing by in the pits. Well, the intrepid crew here is watching, listening to radios, and they are finding things out just about as fast as we are. There's a great affection for this young driver. They are very, very concerned about him. They are hoping, as we do, that all is going to ultimately work out well for Tommy Kendall. They do not know why that wheel separated from the car as it apparently did. They are just at this point hoping that when he comes out, it's all going to be okay. The man in the white hat with glasses at upper left is Jim Miller, the car owner, and the man who is made a tremendous personal commitment to bringing an all-American design, built and powered race car into the Camel GT series to run with the best in the world. You see the medical crews on hand now bringing out the stretcher for Tom Kendall. From a big racing family, his brother Bart also races. His father Chuck Kendall raced for many years. I obviously raced against his father, I raced against Tom as well. But um, I don't like the look of that stretch, of course. Let's hope that it's the damage done is minimal, and let's hope that most of this is uh, precautionary rather than absolute necessity. Tommy, the 86, 87, and 88 champion in the IMSA GTU category for small, under three liter and displacement engine sedans, and also the 1990 Sports Car Club of America Trans Am sedan champion. He has driven Indy cars. He has driven Winston Cup cars, most recently substituting for the injured Kyle Petty at Sears Point International Raceway in California. He's driven extremely well in Winston Cup stock cars right here at Watkins Glen. In fact, he led the Winston Cup race here a year ago, I believe, before running into a, uh, a problem and dropping back in the field. He was right up in the hunt at Sears Point just a few weeks ago, of course, in, in Petty's car, um, taking a turn at uh, running very close to the front. A very skilled driver. If he has one drawback as a driver, unfortunately, it's something about which he can do absolutely nothing, and that is that he's over six foot tall. And uh, if he wants to drive in single seaters, which is most drivers' ambition to be either a Formula One or an IndyCar driver, he really wants to be about uh, five, six absolute max. But there's nothing he can do about that. The field continues behind the safety car, and as it does, let's get caught up with our Audi mid race recap. Whatever the road, Audi lets you take control. After 65 laps in this two and a half hour race, your leader, the 99, Juan Fangio Jr., leading six laps of the 65 run at that point. He was a fifth leader in the race thus far. You see the average speed slowed by two major caution flags, one for Raul Boisel's Jaguar crash, and now for Tommy Kendall's head-on shunt into the wall. The leaders are pole-sitting car of Bernd Schneider in a Porsche, the number two of Davy Jones led for about 45 laps. Then the number 65, this car right here for Tommy Kendall. The number 83 of Jeff Brabham and now Juan Fangio on the number 99 machine. You see the cars out of the race to this point. Bozell with a crash, Jim Pace with electrical problems, vibrations on the other two cars. Hotchkiss and Adams with electrical woes as well. Jeff Klein's car parked by the side of the racetrack. Tommy Kendall has crashed. There you see the race leaders thus far. Five different makes of car have led the race thus far. We are now one hour and 23 minutes in. So an hour and seven minutes remain as scheduled here in the Camel Continental. There's the number 99, the Toyota of Juan Manuel Fangio II, now listed as the race leader, running third in line following cars after having made its pit stops. We'll take a quick time out while work continues on Tommy Kendall's car. We'll be back to Watkins Glen live in just a moment. The action continues here at beautiful Watkins Glen, New York, as the contenders for the 1991 IMSA Camel GT Championship seek to enter their names alongside all the great racers who have driven here. ESPN Speed World coverage of Camel Continental 8 from Watkins Glen is being brought to you by Yokohama Tires, advanced technology on wheels. By Smooth Bush Beer and easy drinking Bush Light. And by Audi, whatever the road, Audi lets you take control. There is the number 99 Toyota of our overall race leader, Juan Fangio II of Argentina. And there you see the work continuing 
on the car that crashed heavily driven by Tommy Kendall. They're still trying to free him from that car. A huge head on shunt into the tire barrier after an apparent left rear suspension break. Well <clears throat> hard to tell what happened exactly of course the wheel could have just come off soon after that pit stop it could be just something like that that had gone wrong here we see it again coming into this turn five like I said before at this point this car is developing over 3G tremendous downforce tremendous grip which obviously puts a great strain on the components and there you see the spat come off as the wheel pushes its way out the wheel just rolls free sparks from underneath the car goes through a full 360 degrees which of course for Tommy Kennel was the worst thing that could have happened because it meant that it nosed into the rail instead of, of course, going in backwards. Tremendous impact. You can see that 2,000 pound car just bouncing around there like a leaf, a leaf in a storm. Just horrendous impact there. And of course, the front of the car where his feet were took the brunt of it. And they've taken a tremendous time to get him out of the car. They've had to take the car apart. And obviously, they're going to extricate him extremely carefully. They brought a backboard in in order to give rigidity to Tommy's back. The first thing you think about are leg injuries. Once but again, of course, Tom, spinal injuries too, in an impact like that, you have to be there, they're, they're taking him out now, they have to be so careful. Obviously the first temptation is just drag him out of the car and get him off to hospital. But obviously you have to move anybody that's been in an impact like that incredibly carefully. If it turns out that they're fine, well that's fine, but you can't uh, take the slightest bit of risk of course. A lot of skilled personnel there. The doctor arrived almost immediately in the Porsche with the blue light on the roof. The upper part of your screen, you see the crew listening to radio reports from the site, which is at the far end of the racetrack in the Turn 5 area. Now, the thing that they have to be concerned about, in addition to the welfare of Tommy Kendall, is the fact that Wayne Taylor is driving an identical race car. And if it was a structural defect or a problem that caused Tommy that high speed impact then they have to decide what to do with Wayne Taylor's car. Does he continue in the race or do they bring him in? Well, if there's the slightest doubt, of course, um, I'm sure they'll bring him in. I've got the answer. Yeah, I just talked to Bob Riley, who designed these cars. He's the chassis man here. He basically, I asked him that exact question. Do you bring the second car in when something like this happens to the first? He said, no, because we've been running this setup all year long. We're not concerned about it. The second car stays on the racetrack. All right, thank you, Dick Berggren. Work continues in the Turn 5 area. It appears as though Tommy has been freed from the car. I think the corner workers are now working in front of the wreck to make Tommy comfortable and get him stabilized. He was reported as being conscious shortly after the wreckage. The rest of the field continues. 24 cars started the race. Eight cars are now officially out. There is Juan Fangio, the overall leader in his Toyota. Second place, the three-time series champion, Jeff Brabham. In third place, Fangio's teammate, Rocky Moran, in the second Toyota. In fourth, Davy Jones and the Bud Light Jaguar that led much of this race up to this point. And in fifth place, the overall points leader by three over his teammate Brabham, Chip Robinson. Our thoughts go out now to Tommy Kendall, to his family. after a tremendous head-on impact with the tire barrier. Once the cars get off the contact patches of the tires, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get them to slow down before they hit the nearest immovable object. Well, of course, on the grass, too, which is uh, all Formula One tracks, as our viewers are aware now, in a situation like this, there would have been a very wide gravel trap. And maybe it's time that some of these uh, smaller tracks I know it's expensive and uh, there are all sorts of arguments why they don't want to do it, but the fact does remain that if there had been a Formula One style gravel trap there, the car may not have even reached the guardrail at all, but it certainly would have slowed down a lot. And Tommy Kendall has right. raised his hand to the crowd. He is smiling on that stretcher. I can't believe it. 
So he's obviously fully alert. Let's just hope the injuries are light. And I think we've seen that the uh, the EDS ICI Chevrolet Intrepid has had about as massive a crash test as man could ever design. You can see the smiles on the faces of the crew. They have obviously received word. And you can't blame them for shedding a tear. Those carbon fiber monocoques, which this car is constructed of, the carbon fiber Kevlar, are unbelievably rigid and strong structures. And of course, it's just exactly what a driver needs in a case like that. So, as happy an ending as we could ask for, Tommy Kendall appears to be all right. He is out of the car and in the ambulance. His race is done. We'll be right back. Back live at Watkins Glen, New York. Bob Varsha, David Hobbs, Dick Berggren, and Chris McClure with you at Camel Continental 8 on the International Motorsports Association Camel GT Trail. Our leader, as we remain under a full course caution, is Juan Fangio II in a Toyota. The first time Toyota has led this year. We are finishing the final cleanup after a savage crash involving Tommy Kendall from La Cañada, California, whose intrepid race car spun after what would appear on the videotape to be a left rear breakage of some kind. The left rear wheel came off the car. He spun and went head on into the tire barrier here at some 120 miles an hour or so. After much work, the wreckage crews cut Tommy from the car and miraculously he waved to the crowds as they put him in the ambulance. So he appears to be at least mentally all right as you watch his teammate Wayne Taylor making his way around the racetrack. Taylor shown in sixth position in the sister car and there is the wreckage of Tommy's car being hauled away. Yeah, you can see how the front of the car has completely crushed. Now, a lot of that's probably worse now than it was after the accident because they had to cut a lot of it off to get him out. Uh, one can only assume from the uh, remarks of Bob Riley that the car, the 64 car of Wayne Taylor's is going to be allowed to continue to run because they feel that the integrity of the car is all right. One can only assume that the wheel wasn't put on right and that that's what they think happened, that the wheel just flat came off. Well, Jim Miller, the car owner, has left the scene. He is apparently in the garage area on the telephone making whatever arrangements he can to try to help his driver, Tommy Kendall, out. The crew chief left almost immediately after the crash. He has been at the crash scene assisting there to try to help people get Kendall out of the automobile. So the main players are no longer in the pit area. They are busy doing the best they can for their driver at this moment. Thank you, Dick. And you can imagine that they are going to want to get at the wreckage of that car to see what they can learn. Certainly Bob Riley, the car designer, Gary Pratt, who helped, who helped build it, the crew chiefs, Jim Miller, the car owner himself. They're all going to want to start pouring at that wreckage and see if they can figure out what went wrong. These are some of the most complicated race cars on Earth, more so even than Indy cars because of the nature of the full bodied fenders the extensive engine management systems, the onboard telemetry and so forth. Very difficult to work on, of course, because all that bodywork uh, gets in the way all the time for the mechanics. They're, they're wide, fully enveloped cars, so they are extremely difficult to work on. And of course, all that bodywork gives the designer such great scope for downforce that these cars do, in fact, uh, develop absolutely prodigious downforce. And at 200 miles an hour down the back straight, these cars probably develop 5,000 pounds or more of downforce. And as I've often said before, if you could put it into a big enough tube and run it up the walls of the tube and run it along the wall of the tube, it would hold itself up. Now Wayne Taylor is in the pits and Dick Bergren is there. It appears that all they're going to do is throw a splash of fuel in the car. They're not taking any of the wheel hubs off to take a look at any of the mechanical components of the car. That's all they've done. Fuel only. They looked at nothing suspension-wise and Taylor is gone. We have less than one hour remaining, so that would be Wayne Taylor's final pit stop in this event. One hour and 37 minutes into this two and a half hour race. It's going to be close, but I would think Wayne Taylor can go the rest of the way. I would expect to see a number of stops, in fact, on this lap. The pace car lights are still on, which would indicate that we're going to go at least one more lap. 
<clears throat> We're on the short course here at Watkins Glen, 2.428 miles, as opposed to the long course, which involves what's called the boot. In addition to the racetrack that adds four corners and brings the overall length to 3.377 miles. We have 53 minutes remaining in Camel Continental 8, and everyone is breathing a lot easier now that we've seen Tommy Kendall wave to the crowd after that massive accident. We'll be right back to turn him loose. On the shores of beautiful Lake Seneca, Watkins Glen, New York, and one of the world's most famous racetracks, Watkins Glen International. Welcome back to our live coverage of Camel Continental 8 on the International Motorsports Association Camel GT Championship Trail, the richest sports car series in the world. Now, about 20 minutes ago, here is what happened to Tommy Kendall at normal speed, the number 65 car to the right of your screen. When you see that at full speed again, it gives you an idea of just the horrendous speed of the impact as he collected that guardrail. The left rear wheel came off, became detached in some way, uh, spun him round under full coring load, probably doing 145 miles an hour when the accident started. And I don't suppose he lost very much speed as he crossed that strip of grass. And we have an unofficial report that Tommy has injuries to his lower legs, one possible broken leg and perhaps more. But as we all saw, he waved to the crowd, very conscious and alert as he went into the back of the ambulance and the people carrying his stretcher were smiling. I think they know they got away with one here today. You see the running order after 71 laps. Many of those cars over 20 deep in the field are now out of the race. We started with 24. We now show eight officially out of the race. As the field continues under caution, we expect to get the green flag very soon. Your leader is Juan Fangio in the Toyota, followed by the Nissan of Jeff Brabham, who started dead stone last in this field. There's the 84 of his teammate, Chip Robinson. Robinson running in fifth behind Rocky Moran in the Toyota and Davy Jones, a longtime race leader in the Jaguar. Wayne Taylor runs sixth, followed by Brian Bonner and Jeff Perner in seventh. John Winter and Bernd Schneider, who started this race on the pole, are eighth, followed by Parker Johnstone, Frank Jelinek and John Grooms, David Tennyson, Herman Velez, Hugh Fuller, John Miro, and Ruggiero Melgrati. Let's get to the Jaguar pits and Chris McClure. Just in is Davy Jones. He stalls it on the way out, but they pushed him. They gave him a splash of fuel. That'll ensure he can go the rest of the distance with under 50 minutes to go. Also, they had to put a part back on the front assembly. One of the louvers over the right front tire had come off. They taped a new one in place to really cut down on drag in that area of the car, and they have him back out and ready to go. Also in was Chip Robinson. They gave him a splash of fuel, and he was out very, very quickly. So those two are set up now to go the distance. As is Wayne Taylor. We expect another stop for the second place car of Jeff Brabham. And I would believe Juan Fangio probably has at least one more stop in his future. The Toyota team was planning on making as many as three stops in this race. I don't know why they wouldn't have stopped in this in this caution period now when we know we've got less than an hour to go. Well, perhaps he can go the rest of the way. Perhaps our pit reporters can find out from Dan Gurney and the team whether Juan Fangio's fuel will be sufficient to carry him the rest of the way. You're on board with Chip Robinson and the Nissan. The V6 twin turbo called the NPT-91. A new four-valve engine in this car, replacing the two-valve engine that brought them so many victories in the last three seasons. That was the view that poor old Tommy Kendall had just right before he went off. Right at that spot was where the thing broke on him. As they come out of that fast turn five up towards six. Pictures from the in-cars today, not quite what you're used to on ESPN, but it's a factor of the weather. The clouds are too low and the helicopter can't get high enough to bounce the pictures back from the truck properly. The Toyotas of Fangio and Rocky Moran will not pit right now. Dan Gurney says the reason is they would not have enough fuel to go all the way. So you got it exactly right, Bob Varsha. They're going to have to wait a little while to make the end. So they will have to hope for another caution flag before this one is done. Starter Jim Sidley has the yellow flag out, and Juan Fangio is gone. A lot of misfiring from these engines as they pop and bang their way down the front straight here because after such a long protracted caution period, a lot of these engines have uh, loaded up. Now Juan Fangio, there you see him going out your screen on the breakaway. There is the 98 car of his teammate Rocky Moran who made a spectacular start and jumped up into second position, I believe. Jumped into second and uh, where in fact is Jeff Brabham in that car behind. There's Jeff Brabham in the 
coming into the top of the picture, Rocky Moran. Going around turn five, which has seen so much action today. Some of it, unfortunately, a long time. So we have a Toyota 1-2 here at Watkins Glen. The number four car is Jeff Perner, Brian Bonner. They are two laps down. Then the number 83 red, white, and blue Nissan of Jeff Brabham, who it would appear just got snookered there at the restart. Well, I think his engine loaded up on that long, long caution pit. As it went by here, somebody was misfiring badly. It it sounds okay now, but it probably was him. Although, he's struggling to get by the Bonner car, which normally you wouldn't expect that Nissan to do. Now remember, Jeff Brabham rolled off the grid very, very slowly at the start of this race, then raced up to join the field, rocketed through the field, made his way all the way to the lead, but he may not be out of the woods yet. Now you're watching the number seven Porsche. That was our pole sitting car, John Winter and Barrett Schneider. They are several laps down at the head of a train that I think includes Jeff Klein's Chevy Spice. Davy Jones in the Jaguar to the left of your screen with the orange visor and Chip Robinson just behind. Davy Jones blasts by all three of those cars, taking uh, Chip Robinson with him, and that uh, Jeff Klein car is hanging right in there. Jeff Klein car, you remember, pulled off to the right of the track right there where we're looking at now, a few laps back. One of those long caution flags helped him, and he got the car back going again. This is what it all looks like from Chip Robinson's driving fleet. Bouncing through turn six into seven. Right into the apex there, lets it go real wide. Just clips the curb under the bridge, under the starter stand, and past the pitch. Not only has Jeff won two races this season, he has won the last two races here at Watkins Glen, looking for a three-peat this year. But more important would be the overall series championship. He leads his teammate Brabham by three points. And he is the last man to win the IMSA Camel GT Championship before Jeff Brabham's string of three straight titles. We have word that Tommy Kendall is being airlifted out of the racetrack to a local hospital, and we wish him well. We will return live to Watkins Glen in a moment. In 1984, professional sports car racing returned to Watkins Glen following a three-year absence. Al Holbert teamed up with Jim Adams and Englishman Derek Bell to campaign a then-new Porsche 962. The race at the Glen was split into two three-hour heats held over two days. Bill Whittington and Randy Lanier took the first heat on Saturday, but on Sunday their Chevy-powered march was knocked from the lead by transmission problems, handing the Holbert Bell Adams Porsche a comfortable four-lap lead to the checkered flag. Great days in Camel GT racing. There you see the overall leader right now, Juan Manuel Fangio. Behind him, his Toyota teammate, Rocky Moran, as they desperately try to put enough distance between themselves and the third place Nissan of Jeff Brabham to get in one last pit stop. It still seems incredible to me that when this race started, they had just about 50 minutes to go, 48 minutes to go. I can't believe that these cars can't run for 48 minutes on gas. Um, makes life awfully difficult for them if they can't. And as you can see, there's not enough time there to come in, put a, even a splash of fuel in without this guy here, Jeff Bradman in the 83 car, assuming the lead. So whichever way they look at it, they're in tough shape. What a race it's been for Jeff Brabham. As you watch Fangio, we'll be looking at the pit lane every time he comes by to see if he'll make his stop. And he does not this time around, nor does teammate Rocky Moran. Davy Jones playing things just a little bit cool here, dropping back from uh, Jeff Brabham. Must be having some sort of a problem with his Jaguar. So quick on both Friday and Saturday in everything that mattered except the final qualifying when Bern Schneider in the number seven Yost Porsche turned such a blistering lap, uh, blistering to the point that it upset his tire balance and uh, has really spoiled his race today somewhat. Plus they had that nose problem earlier on. Jeff Brabham closing in now on Rocky Moran. Oh, a yellow got flag. A yellow flag is someone else off at that corner. Same corner. Once again, turn five. Yeah, spinner, but it's uh, it's one of the Camel Lights cars, the number 36 of uh, Frank Jelinek and John Grooms, I believe. Seems to have spun uneventfully. Now sort of driving down the middle of the road. There goes the Jaguar. 
That's an example of a kudzu race car built in the shops of Jim Downing down in Atlanta, named kudzu for the ubiquitous weed that seems to overgrow everything in that part of the country at this time of year. The 99 and 98 car going by the pits one more time, didn't stop. Jeff Brabham shadowing them. There you see the 48 car letting the 99, the 48 car being the current leader of the Camel Lights. That's the Parker Johnston Acura car. And there's our leader, 99. Now he is pulling out a bit of a lead. Meanwhile, Dick Bergman has a comment from the pits. Well, I got a fellow who is going to have a comment for sure. This is Gary Donahoe. He is the team manager for Toyota. How long are you going to wait before you bring Fonjo in? Well, we're going to run him right down to the bottom. If we get a yellow sooner, we'll have to evaluate uh, how long the yellow will be and if we could possibly go to the end. But right now, it looks like we're going to go until she's empty and then fill her up and go home. Is the problem that you're, you're afraid you would not otherwise have enough fuel to make it all the way, or do you want to run light at the end? We're in the window right now. If we had a yellow, we, uh, we could make it to the end if we filled up now. How far can you go before you have to bring him in? Uh, we've got a, another, I don't know, another 20 minutes or so, I think. And they've got the calculators and the computers out for sure. Boy, that would make it so close. There is Juan Fangio, the new daddy, his son, Juan Fangio, but not Juan Manuel Fangio. Manuel, what's that mean? Does it say? 99 goes round the 80 car. Jeff Brabham comes around the 98 of Rocky Moran down that long straight. And just behind the number 48 Acura Spice of Camel Lights class race leader Parker Johnstone. David Tennyson runs second in that class on the same lap as Parker, but we didn't see him in that picture. So Brabham goes by Rocky Moran. Jeff Brabham beginning to move up the track. He was going to pit under the yellow. They had the cone out. We're waiting to bring him in for fuel to make sure he could go the rest of the distance. And the green flag fell and he stayed out. But it appears as though he will have to peel off in these last 40 minutes of this race and come in for at least a splash and go. Bob Sproul, his crew chief, anticipate having to do that. That puts a different light, of course, on Davy Jones, who just... He needs to hang in relatively close because these guys will be making some pretty lightning pit stops. Jeff Brabham's pit is right at the beginning of the pit lane, so he'll just shoot in off the track, put some gas in, and off he'll go. Won't lose much time. So Davey doesn't need to let him get too far in front. There you see Rocky Moran now running in third spot. But the Toyotas, whichever way you look at it, having a great day. They will be a factor the rest of the way until they bring their new car on board perhaps as early as the next round of this series at Laguna Seca in California. There's Davy Jones in the Jag bouncing its way into turn six. You can see the car there. Of course, with these ground effect cars, the idea is to try and keep the gap between the, the car and the road even as long as possible, uh, which is why, or keep the gap equal all the time, which is why they have to be so stiffly sprung to avoid any uh, diving under braking, uh, squatting under acceleration and roll, of course. But it does make them stiff and it makes them very uncomfortable to drive. Notice that bump on top of Davy Jones's Jaguar. That is there to meet the specifications that require that the roof of the car be as high as the rear wing. Didn't want to make the whole roof that high and create all that aerodynamic drag, so they just put that one little bump up there. Technically, they are in compliance. He comes up behind David Tennyson. Second place car in the Camel Lights class and zooms past. Weaving his way through the traffic there. David Tennyson has dropped back some from Parker Johnstone, the class leader. Well, David Tennyson had that extra stop. In fact, I wonder if he's going to be able to keep going to the end. Probably can. There you see the number 32 car of Ken Knott from Atlanta, Georgia, and Spaniard Fermin Velez, the former world champion in the sports car class known as C2, the European equivalent of that time of these Camel Lights cars. No turbocharging, lighter weight, a little bit slower. That class no longer exists in European competition. Velez showing his colors today in the Camel Lights class in the United States. Live action continues from Watkins Glen, once again, we have a solid overcast, and there is a possibility of rain before this one is over. Back at Watkins Glen, Davy Jones has given up the fourth place position. 
His crew was relaxed and uh, sitting by just watching the race. Suddenly they leap forward a flat tire, we're told, brought him around very, very slowly. They're going for all four tires since he had to come in to maintain the balance. A full set going on, the skirts on the back, no fuel this stop, but obviously a very costly turn of events for Davy Jones in the Jaguar. Everything is ready to go except the right front and the uh, impact wrench is, is jammed. They go for another wrench, they go for another hose, and finally they're able to turn the bolt and tighten it down, and now he's down off the jacks and ready to pull away. The last two times he tried to leave, he did stall, and they're working at the back. There he goes, drops the clutch, a bit of a hesitation in a way, but a long, long pit stop suddenly for Davy Jones. And a lot of smoke out the back of that car. It's like maybe he had a little trouble finding a gear, getting first gear at least in the pits. Meanwhile, on the racetrack, Rocky Moran has taken back second place from Jeff Brabham. Davey exiting the pits quite slowly. There you see the 98 Toyota of Moran with headlights on, the 83 Nissan of the three-time series champion, Jeff Brabham. Well, of course, that stop for Davey Jones was a disaster. Taking away any taking away any real chance he had of winning this race. Going slowly through the S's is obviously not just a flat tire. He's obviously got a problem. Oh. Something's broken. And so the Jaguar frustration will continue. In the four years they've been racing here, if I'm not mistaken, Jaguar has been fortunate to even finish the race. They absolutely dominate some of the circuits that we visit on the Camel GT Trail, especially Road Atlanta. But somehow Watkins Glen has always stymied them. And now Davy Jones, who grew up in nearby McGraw, New York, in the Cortland area, now living in, in uh, Nevada, in the Lake Tahoe area, scheduled to be married to the former Mary Elizabeth Meekum on Labor Day weekend. His frustration on his home track will continue another year. Meanwhile, two apparently healthy race cars going at it for second place. There is Rocky Moran from Cota de Gaza, California, and Jeff Brabham, originally from Australia, now living on the Atlantic coast of Florida. Ooh, getting caught up with the, uh, the Appleby car there. It's the five car, five car Jeff, Jeff Klein. Klein. Coming down the front straight, everybody wanted to try and get through. Jeff goes to the inside. Nope, can't do it. Thwarted again by Klein. He was thwarted at the beginning of that lap by another couple of slow cars. Interesting that Jeff Brabham will involve himself in a fight here. He must know that Rocky Moran is going to have to pit that car eventually. So is he, isn't he? Well, that's true, too. He may still have a pit stop coming for him. He did get out of his pit stop sequence early on when he spun off the racetrack in a collision with Raul Bozell. Came in, got maintenance very early in the race in about the first 25 minutes. Made a second and a third pit stop. He may not need another one. The thing is that if uh, Rocky Moran just uh, keeps him at bay and keeps the pace down just a little bit, it's going to give his teammate, Fangio, enough breathing room that he can make his stop and Jeff Brabham will never catch him. Well, now let's get back to the Jaguar pit and Chris McClure. They thought it was a flat tire. That's why they brought him in originally. Davey had called that in from the cockpit. The four new tires did nothing. Tony Dow thinks maybe differential. One other crew member said, I think suspension. And right now the cowling's off. They're trying to find out exactly what it is. And the engine is off. More frustration for Davy Jones and the Bud Light Jaguar team. Well, as I said, when he when he went out and was going slowly, I said it was, you know, not a flat tire. Something's broken. It's, you don't know what, of course. Um, maybe those lightning starts that the team likes so much have played against him. Jeff 30 Brabham. minutes to go. Jeff Brabham. in a problem. I think Rocky Moran may be out of fuel. You see those fumes coming from the exhaust. If it's not something more serious, little puffs of smoke. Jeff sets off in hot pursuit now of the leader, 99. Juan Fangio, where his teammate, number 98, Rocky Moran, makes his way slowly back to the pitch. Heavy exhaust fumes from the car. You can see the, the smudges of dirt around the wheels caused by the carbon fiber brakes they use on these cars. Rocky Moran apparently will have to pit. Dick Bergman is standing by now in the pits of the Dan Gurney All-American Racers Toyota team. 
they're ready. Here's Rocky in. The whole back of this car is very dark. At the moment, the engine is silent. It is not running at all. This is clearly going to be a long pit stop. This is not what they had in mind for a quick splash and go toward the end of the race. They're working inside the cockpit of the car on the electronics of the automobile, whose engine still is silent on pit road. The engine on Moran's car is dead as he sits here. A crew member still working inside the car. Long, long, frustrating pit stop for Rocky Moran. He's been in here 24, 26 seconds. Now the engine is fired. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good at all. He can't get it in gear. Long pit stop, and he's still dieseling out that exhaust pipe. That would indicate, I would think, a fuel mixture problem. Maybe that engine management system got a little haywire. That could be the sort of thing that goes wrong. And it's, uh, and it's a bit of a chip. The chip, the electronic chip fails and suddenly it goes on full rich, full weak or whatever. Number two, we've got a broken Heim joint on the suspension. There you see the 98 car still smoking heavily. Wait a minute, go no farther. What is a Heim joint? A Heim joint is a little thing that holds the suspension okay. together. So it's a ball joint. Thanks to that for aircraft use and now used extensively on racing cars. Thought it was a harmonic synthesizer related sort of thing. A very nice, very expensive universal joints, ball joints. There's nothing on these cars that isn't. Your overall race leader, Juan Manuel Fangio, with a pit stop somewhere in his future. The mystery is when. We have less than 30 minutes to go. A 15-second lead for Juan Manuel Fangio. Through turn one, rocketing down to turn two, into the S's, climbing uphill right-hander, left-hander, and then leaping out onto the back straightaway and reaching up for 190 miles an hour in terminal velocity. It still is a 15 second lead, and that would be enough if Jeff Brabham has to stop as well. Obviously, all things being equal, uh, he should be able to maintain his lead. If Jeff Brabham does not have to stop, he's done for. All weekend long, Watkins Glen, along with much of the Northeast, has been in the grip of 95 to 100 degree temperatures. Today is a very cool 65 degrees or so. A look back at the interval from the leading car of Juan Fangio to the headlights of Jeff Brabham. Down to one headlight now as he sweeps around the Frank Jelinek, John Groom's green camel light car. And just ahead of him is Wayne Taylor in the second of those Chevy Intrepids that were involved in that massive crash suffered by Tommy Kendall. Dick Berggren is in the Toyota pit. And Rocky Moran is in the Toyota pit too, and that's not the plan. They're in the process right now of changing the spark plugs in this engine. Now very early in this race, we thought maybe Rocky had a problem because the crew members were hanging around here with plugs in their hands, but they said, oh no, 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 everything is just fine. Well, at the moment, it is not fine, and they now admit that they do have an engine misfire. Can't go wrong on that. The black box has been changed. Four spark plugs in the process of being changed. They're doing a good job on that engine. This is a good, quick adjustment. Chris McClure? Well, the last pit stop for Davy Jones is now stretched to a full five minutes. A left side upper wishbone is what was fractured and caused the problem that they thought originally was a flat tire, a major suspension component, and the repairs are underway. The bad one is out, and they're switching around some parts, putting in some bolts. There goes the wishbone as they throw it across the pit in a little bit of disgust, but they're sitting there quietly. The engine's still off. A long repair for Davy Jones. That was a Heim joint. Thank Thank you. Now you may be wondering why these teams are fighting so hard to get back in the race. Keep in mind only three cars are still on the lead lap. Rocky Moran is two laps down, followed by Wayne Taylor, Brian Bonner and Jeff Perner, John Winter and Baron Schneider. Davy Jones now three laps down in eighth position, but if they can get their cars fixed, get back on the racetrack, there are points through 10th place to be picked up. Live action still to come your way from Watkins Glen, New York. We are in the closing half hour of the Camel Continental. The leading Toyota, Juan Manuel Fangio, in and out of the All-American Racers Toyota pits. Dick, what did we learn? Well, what we learned basically is they certainly have enough fuel to go all the way now. They did that pit stop at 14.78 seconds. They took no tires. They took fuel only. He's got his work cut out for him. He's going to win this race from here. Wayne Taylor goes rocketing by Juan Manuel Fangio, still trying to get it up to speed. 
certainly seemed to be actually quite a long stop really with so late in the race uh, I wouldn't have thought that they needed that much gas but there it is they obviously decided they did Chip Robinson reassumed the lead went by him while he was stopped in the pits now they're going to have to keep their fingers crossed that Chip Robinson too will have to stop from a Toyota 1-2 we have come to the brink of a Nissan 1-2 as the fortunes ebb and flow here at Watkins Glen. Now there you see that white car, Furman Velez, 83, Jeff Brabham is Jeff in the pits. in the pits. That battle in the Camel Lights class was for second place behind Parker Johnstone. Let's get down to Chris McClure in the Nissan pit. Flipping the throttle is Jeff Brabham. He's been here five seconds, six, seven, eight. Fuel only, the car is on the ground, the fuel hose is away. He is away, 10 seconds. Great pit stop for the Nissan team. His teammate Chip Robinson is just crossing the start finish line. I think Jeff will be overtaken just as he reaches the pit exit. Keep your eye out for the other blue and white Nissan. No, here it comes. He got out ahead of him. And that is for first place. If I'm not I mistaken, think, I think that Fangio, I looked out the window and I missed it, but I, Fangio must have passed him. If he didn't, Fangio's in problem because I don't see him. He hasn't come along yet, so I must have missed him. We haven't seen the 99 car, so Fangio may have reassumed the lead over Brabham and Robinson in that order. There he is. Juan Fangio now about to cross the start finish line, so I got he is back in first place. So 99 must be in the lead. Having just put a lap on Wayne Taylor, now two laps down in fourth place. So we have three cars on the lead lap. This man, Juan Fangio the second in the Toyota, followed by Jeff Brabham and Chip Robinson. And he's leading uh, by 12 seconds or thereabouts. We have just over 20 minutes remaining in this race and it should be a dandy of a finish. Juan Fangio trying to break the Toyota slump this year. They are still looking for their first victory in 1991. There is Jeff Brabham in the second place car. And just behind him, the number 84 machine of his Nissan teammate, Chip Robinson. Wayne Taylor runs in fourth position. You're on board now with Chip through that turn five area. Picking up a gear into the turn six. You can see how bumpy it is there and the screen. Absolutely. The car bouncing around, shaking that onboard camera out to the edge of the road. I think that backs off a little bit. That graphic was wrong. Chip is third, not fourth. Across the start finish line, past the packed pits. Big crowd still waiting for the end of this one. Very, very good crowd here at Watkins Glen this afternoon. Jeff Brabham sweeps through those very, very fast S's. Now David Tennyson has reassumed second place in Camel Lights ahead of Furman Velez in that white number 32 car. The 22-year-old Canadian Tennyson is battling a world champion in the closing moments of this race. Furman Velez is a very, very quick driver. There's no doubt about it. And if David Tennyson can hold him off, He'll have done extremely well, passing the number 11 car there. That's the Miro Sadivi car. One of the older Tigers. They used to make up much of the bulk of the class in Camel Lights. But these spice racers built in Britain, as I said earlier, are really the hot ticket in the class right now. Tennyson swings wide. Velez right there behind him. Velez co-drove to several Camel Lights victories last year with the eventual class champion, Tomas Lopez of Mexico. Losing ground slightly now to David Tennyson, I'd say. Meanwhile, Parker Johnstone swans on his way in the, in the lead again. There's the number seven car just going out of the picture and into the picture comes the 99, our leader. The race leader, Toyota. Here comes the Camel Lights leader, just behind the overall leader. This is Parker Johnstone from Redmond, Oregon. And if he should win this afternoon, he'll have 21 points. Possibility of 22 if he did the fastest lap as well. And a chance to fatten up his already overwhelming lead in the Camel Lights Driver Championship. 
We're getting into the closing minutes. Less than 20 minutes remain in Camel Continental, and this should be a great finish. Stay with us. The Finger Lakes region of upstate New York is renowned around the world for its wine production. Some 40 family-owned individual wineries dot the shorelines of Seneca Lake. And there are six other major lakes in the chain, each with wineries of their own. In the late stages of the Camel Continental, the number 99 Toyota of Juan Fangio leads the way, having made his final pit stop being pursued desperately by the Nissans of Jeff Brabham and Chip Robinson. We have an update now on Tommy Kendall that we want to pass along. He has been airlifted to Robert Packer Hospital in Sayre, Pennsylvania, just across the border. He has a compound fracture of his right leg and possible fractures of his left leg. Otherwise, he is apparently all right, and that is somewhat miraculous after that incredibly savage crash head on into the tire barriers. I have to say that if that happened, uh, had happened at the beginning of my career, for instance, or even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the results of a crash like that would have been far more serious uh, than that, in fact, because these cars are so strong. The integrity of these chassis is such that one can sustain huge crashes and get away with relatively, I mean, I use the word here in a relative term, uh, get away with relatively light industry. Uh, industry. We'll pick up the gap back to the second place car. Jeff Brabham with one headlight on. The lead just over 11 seconds, first to second. That has come down a little bit in the last couple of laps. I agree with you, David. The car construction techniques have come a long way. And driver safety is as important, if not more important, than getting down the road. And it becomes a, a very important part of it is the, is the driver safety. And of course, these super stiff chassis just happen to uh, provide excellent handling characteristics as well. I mean, the stiffer the chassis, the better it handles. As simple as that, really. And um, there you see him just going out of the picture, Jeff Brabham. There's his teammate, 84, the current leader of the championship. But 64, Wayne Taylor, the winner of the last race in this series, just two weeks ago, not having such a good afternoon, but still, an all, considerably better than his teammates afternoon, I suppose one would have to say. Got to give a lot of credit to Wayne Taylor. It takes a lot of courage to keep romping around and putting that car on 10 tenths. That's out the back of Chip Robinson's Nissan NPT 91. There is Robinson circulating in third position. Is Faggio, Brabham, Robinson, Wayne Taylor two laps down. The top three cars all still on the lead lap. Brian Bonner and Jeff Perner run fifth. Sixth is John Winter and Baron Schneider in the pole sitting Porsche. Seventh, Rocky Moran in the second Toyota after those lengthy pit stops with electrical problems. Now this is the battle for second place that we've been monitoring as Chip Robinson begins to overtake Furman Velez in the white Buick powered Spice and the Denon Ferrari. Whoa, Velez obviously not watching his mirrors. Well, he himself is struggling to get around um, David Tennyson. David right? Tennyson, and of course he didn't realize it. I don't think he realized for a minute that Chip Robinson was there. Ooh, Chip Robinson squeezes between them, around the outside of, of Velez and on the inside of David Tennyson. You can tell the speed at which Chip went by. That's the differential between the big GTP cars, many of them turbocharged, and the less powerful Camel Lights cars. All of them, mind you, rocketing down that back straightaway at about 160 or more miles an hour, at least. They get up to 160 along this short stretch here into turn six, and then again past the pits. They're up to nearly 145, 150 miles an hour down there. Because all the corners here are so fast, the exit speeds are quick, and, and they pick up an enormous amount extra speed. Furman Velez knows his way around that Spice chassis very well. He was a factory driver for the Spice team in the world sports car competition several years back. There is David Tennyson holding on to second place, trying desperately to close up a little bit on Parker Johnstone. We now have less than 15 minutes remaining in the race. There's your overall leader, Juan Manuel Fangio II of Argentina. Crossing the stripe. Not many more times to go. Down past the pits where no doubt Dan Gurney is uh, 
gazing with a very beaming face at his uh, young lad. And here comes Chip Robinson, not so very far behind. Catching up slowly but surely, but he's got a fair way to go to catch him in a short time. Rocketing off into the distance goes Juan Manuel Fangio out the bottom of your picture winter leader in the camel lights class Parker Johnstone a victory would do wonders for Juan Fangio. It may just seal up the driver's championship in camel lights for this man Parker Johnstone 30 years of age and continuing a dream season for the contact Acura BF Goodrich Spice team. Parker goes on his merry way. We'll take another quick timeout and return to live action from Watkins Glen International. With 10 minutes exactly to go in a most eventful afternoon of Camel GT racing here at Watkins Glen, Bob Varsh and David Hobbs with you. Your overall race leader, Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina. That man right there, Parker Johnstone of Redmond, Oregon, the leader in the Camel Lights class. If he, clinch, if he uh, wins the race today, or wins the class today with his bowl position point as well, that pretty well assures him of clinching the Camel Light Championship, which at this stage of the year is pretty outstanding. As I said earlier on, Tom Elliott, who's uh, Vice President of Honda North America, is here watching uh, his Acura engine car. I'm sure he still is here, unless of course he's had to get on a plane and go to Japan, these guys flip all around the world all the time. But this has proved to be a very good investment for them, I feel sure. Up front, Juan Manuel Fangio, who got in a great pit stop to get the car fueled up under green and get back out ahead of the man you see coming into your picture there with his headlight on, Jeff Brabham in the Nissan. Ironically, just a few years ago, Fangio lost a race when the Toyota team had too many crewmen over the wall. He was held in the pits and then held in the pits for an additional 10 second penalty when one of the crewmen didn't have his uh, his equipment in order. So how ironic that they would come back today and split second pit work is what saves the day for Juan Fangio up against the same man with the Nissan team Jeff Brabham. It certainly would have been a great week for Japanese motorsport. This time last week, Mazda was winning the Le Mans 24-hour race on ESPN. And this week, it looks as if here at Watkins Glen, which, as you said, is the oldest and greatest racetrack, road racing track in the state, uh, we're going to have a Toyota win the race, and a Nissan come second, and an Acura win the Camel Lights. <laughs> so I guess there's a few people going to be thinking hard back in various boardrooms across the United States. Well, we've already mentioned the story broken by Tom Higgins with the Charlotte Observer and appearing in the local newspapers here in the Corning area. The General Motors plans to revamp its racing operations with a tremendous impact on all of its racing in NASCAR Winston Cup, in kart Indy car racing, in Camel GT sports car racing, and probably other forms of the sport as well. Chevy, Buick, Oldsmobile divisions, all will be taking a hard look at their programs and making some perhaps severe changes. There you see the running order after 110 laps. We are down to about seven minutes and change remaining. Davy Jones back there in 13th spot. Not exactly where he would have liked to have been at this stage of the race. The car was looking so promising all through practice and qualifying. And uh, here he is languishing back in 13th spot. After what I must say has to be some sort of record breaking uh, suspension piece changing section I've ever seen it just uh, only lost what three laps and, and changing part of the rear suspension very very quick there goes your leader out of the picture there comes David Tennyson running second right now in the camel lights class try to get a look at the gap back to the other cars still in contention that right behind Tennyson is Furman Velez who is uh, lying third in that class and is desperately trying to wrest second place away from David Tennyson. They had a pretty severe tussle just a few laps back, just for at least for the moment. Herman Valdez appears to have dropped off the pace just a little bit. Give credit to David Tennyson for a terrific drive, the most improved driver in Camel Lights a year ago. He has gotten the better of a former world championship and a champion that is in this class of cars. Across the tire marks where the old circuit, the long circuit, joins. The NASCAR short circuit here at Watkins Glen, the 83 Nissan of Jeff Brabham, down 14 seconds. 
to the Toyota of Juan Manuel Fangio. The gap from first to second in Camel Lights, 47 and a half seconds. Six minutes left in the race. Now, should Jeff Brabham finish 14 seconds down, that will become the closest margin of victory in Camel GT history at this racetrack. The previous closest, 21 seconds. There is Chip Robinson in the number 84 Nissan running third behind Fangio and his teammate Brabham. Chip Robinson in the 84 car, the sister car to Jeff Brabham. Chip running in third spot. Currently leads the championship by three points. Uh, obviously, as far as he's concerned, it would be absolutely great if Fangio does win this race from a points point of view, personally speaking, because that means that he will still be leading the championship by one point over Jeff Brabham. Parker Johnstone, the leader in the Camel Lights class. Once again, there's Chip Robinson on the bumpy run down to turn six and seven just before the start finish straightaway. Terribly bumpy coming into there. Here comes Parker Johnson and the Acura engine Spice over those same bumps. Doesn't look quite as bumpy that car. They may have set up a slightly more compliant suspension system on there. Plus, it doesn't have quite the downforce of the big cars because it doesn't have the power to pull it, and so it doesn't have to be quite as stiffly sprung. Parker Johnstone coming at you. Behind him, the number four car shared by Jeff Perner and Brian Bonner out of Tom Milner's racing stables in Virginia. There is the 98 of Rocky Moran shown back in the 10th position behind the top six GTP cars and the top three Camel Lights cars after that long stop to fix his electrics. We are now less than five minutes from the end of the race, about five laps remaining in Camel Continental 8 from Watkins Glen International Racing Circuit in beautiful Watkins Glen, New York. Stay with us. Back live at Watkins Glen, New York, looking down the S's that have been a part of so many great races over the years. We have a great one here today. Chip Robinson, the third place car, has made his final pit stop. We are down to about two minutes and a half remaining in this two and a half hour affair. Your leader is Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina, driving for Dan Gurney's Toyota team, looking for his car fifth career victory in 44 starts in Camel GT Racing. Had a quick look out Chip Robinson's front window. We'll go up to Fangio's car. A man en route to a payday of some $50,000, including $20,000 in what's called the Camel Pyramid, a special $20,000 bonus to first-time winners. Any car in the field could have won it. This is known as a wild card event on the trail. As you see, Dan Gurney, talk about a guy who's been a part of many great races over the year. Lamar winner, winner of a Formula One race and a car that he built himself, and that was the beginning of the Eagle Series of which this is the latest derivation pending the arrival of their newest Eagle race car. There is Juan Fangio. Being closely hounded now by David Jones' Jaguar. Back to full speed, but of course, unfortunately, just a little bit too late. They had to stop to change the suspension piece. Bit of a record-breaking stop, I must admit, to change the suspension piece, but unfortunately dropped them. Uh, way back down the order, running in 13th spot at the moment. 13th overall, of course, that is. 13th overall, he is 6 and 8, eight, eight and among yeah. GTP cars, and that will earn him points, Still and that's points. why right. the Tom Walkinshaw racing team worked so hard to get him back in the race. But, unfortunately for them, of course, the gap will widen uh, between Davy Jones and the current two leaders, Jeff Brabham and Chip Robinson. Brabham and Robinson running second and third to the 99 Toyota of Juan Manuel Fangio. They just put another lap on Parker Johnstone at the back of your picture there. Johnstone leading the Campbell Lights class. Davey's car looks like it's as quick as Fangio's now that he's got himself some new suspension pieces. Across the starting line, one lap to go. We are on the final lap of this race. Juan Manuel Fangio trying to keep body, soul, and race car together for one more loop around this 2.428 mile circuit. Of course, right at this stage is what Davy Jones wants is for Juan, Fa uh, Juan Fangio to win this race as well, to take away that maximum points from the Nissan team. Now, pending the result of who set fast lap in this race, if Brabham and Robinson finish second and third, they will be tied 
for the 1991 championship with several races, of course, still to run. Those being at Laguna Seca, California, Portland, Oregon, a race you'll see here on ESPN, Road America in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, and the series finale in Del Mar, California, coming up in October. There is the man himself, Big Dan Gurney. He wouldn't be able to put Dan Gurney in a modern Formula One car, but very successful in his day in the early 60s. There's the checkered flag. There's a very happy Dan Gurney. Congratulating his man, Juan Manuel Fangio II, on his first victory of 1991. There's the number 83 Nissan of Jeff Brabham, who came from dead last in this field, led at one point, but his pit strategy was thrown off. He had to take an extra stop. He will come home a fine and well-earned second in today's race. His teammate, Chip Robinson, will finish behind him in third. And there is Parker Johnstone, the overall leader in the Camel Lights glass, waving to the crowd. He knows his race is done. He has a reach to check flag. Let's get down quickly to the Toyota Pits and Chris McClure. Huge celebration, as you can well imagine. Dan Gurney, he gave you a second at Lime Rock, now a first here at legendary Watkins Glen. Nicely done. Well, uh, our team calls Juan, his nickname is Senna, and I think you might know the reason. We think he's just, there's no one any better. Great going, Gary. And uh, we're awfully proud of him. He, he, <laughs> he pulled one off today. Didn't he? Well, your crew helped him in that last stop. It was a splash and go, but he had to, he had to do it. They had to do it. Well, I mean, that's true everywhere. I mean, you can't afford to make any mistakes with the competition like it is, and uh, we're just so proud we can hardly stand it. Yeah, terrific. All right, Dan Gurney, one of the great names in American racing, and this man is making himself a name, a winner of a celebrity race in Miami, Florida, about five years ago, the first time I saw Juan Manuel Fangio II, and he has come through to one of the prime rides in world sports car racing, and he has made the most of it. We'll be right back.